Okay, I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the CUSB 303 School Board on Monday, June 14th, 2021 at 7 p.m. 7.01 p.m., excuse me. Martin, would you call roll? Yes, Mrs. Bell? Here. Mrs. Fairgreen? Here. Mr. Lackner? Here. Mrs. McCabe? Here. Mr. McNally? Here. Ms. Weibel? Here. And Mrs. Barker? Here. Please stand for the pledge. Thank you for the assist. Okay, we have something called a public hearing and um, we are gonna have a public hearing on the fiscal year 2020, 2021, uh, 303 amended budget. Um, the amended budget was discussed at the April 26th business services meeting and approved for public display and public hearing. Okay. All right, guys, we need to make sure we're, we're, we're moving along here. I'm sorry if you can't hear, I'm gonna speak as closely to this microphone as possible. Okay, thank you. And the public hearing was approved for public display at meeting on May 10th. Are there any comments on the amended budget only? Any public comments on the amended budget only? Okay, I'm gonna take that as there are no comments on the amended budget. Board members, do you have any comments? Nope. Okay then, that was easy. The hearing is now closed at 7.03 p.m. Dr. Pearson, the superintendent's report, please. Thank you, Mrs. Barker. Um, I just have two brief items this evening. The first one, um, we are anxiously awaiting continued information from the Illinois State Board of Education and IDPH about our plans for the fall. Um, you may have heard on Friday that they did update the sports guidance and now fully vaccinated students can participate in sports indoors and outdoors without a mask. We continue to be hopeful that we're moving in that direction for school in the fall, and we should have that information hopefully for you by our July board meeting. So we look forward to an update at that time. I also wanted to just update you um, or point out actually that in the uh, consent agenda, we always have the gifts and donations section. And often we have community members that make donations to the district. And um, we actually had a, a substantial donation this, this uh, month. Um, uh, um, an anonymous donor gave $50,000 for the North um, LRC. Um, and so I just, I didn't want that to pass by without recognizing that and just expressing appreciation. Um, this donor wanted our, our North High School students to have some money to go towards their improvements in the LRC, which is something that we're working on um, at, uh, as a larger plan. And this will be able to contribute to that. So I wanted to, to point that out. And that's all that I have. Thank you, Ms. Barker. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Okay, we do have citizens comments. Um, we have, uh, looks like 60, 62 citizens comments today. Now, um, according to our uh, policy, um, we, have the, we have some options. And so we have the ability to shorten the time for each person to address the board during public participation to conserve time and give the maximum number of people an opportunity to speak. We also can ex have an expansion of the overall 30 minutes for public participation and the 20 minute minimum total length for any one subject. I would like to see if we would like to talk about possibly doing one of those to allow for the maximum amount of speakers. Uh, from my standpoint, I would uh, welcome and like to hear all of the comments. 
what I had said was that I would like to hear all of your comments if you've signed up to provide any. Thank you. Ms. President Barker, I'd like to look at asking our constituents to limit their comments if it's been repeated. I'm assuming most of our commentators are here tonight regarding deep equity. I don't wanna make that assumption. But if um, what we've asked for in the past is that if someone has said something that is similar to what they're gonna say, that they just come up and state their name and say that um, some of the sentiment that they share has already been stated and share anything that's new to the topic. And that would um, help limit because okay. at 62 people in three minutes, that would be three hours of comments. Um, and that is six times our policy limit. So I would just caution the board um, to come up with a idea here. So I, I would like to, I'd like to uh, uh, kind of echo what the surgery said. Uh, I'd like to hear everybody. I do understand as well, they're, they're an hour, and, uh, I'm sorry, 180 uh, minutes of, of comments um, is significant. Um, so I wanna make sure that we, we get to the point where we're, I don't wanna get to the point where, where we're, there are so many comments that, that we're, we're falling asleep here. Um, so, and I, although I, I doubt that will happen tonight, um, but I, I do want to. I, I would like to hear at least the sentiment for, from everyone. So, if we can just ask people to uh, to to keep it as brief as they possibly can, I I think that's not an unreasonable request. But uh, I certainly don't want to tell them precisely how to do that. But um, uh, in keeping so that we're not here, so that we're not here till midnight. Um, I, I would agree with Mr. McNally and um, Mrs. Fairgrieve. What I would ask is if people could look at Mrs. Marsan because she will give them time limits so they know how long they have and understand that when we get to the three minutes, there are other people who also want to speak so that we can make sure we hear from everybody. Are there any other thoughts? Maybe we can split the difference and do a two minute limit and everyone speaks. That gets us in just over two hours. Okay, so that puts us at nine o'clock before we start our meeting. Okay. Just keeping, keeping that in mind. I am racking my brain how to come up with some sort of compromise and that's the only thing I could come up with Mr. Lechner. However, I don't feel comfortable saying I don't wanna someone to speak. So what I can say to all of you is to try to be aware that we have a really big meeting tonight that has nothing to do with deep equity. We have a deep equity issue to deal with as well, which is also a big issue. So um, from someone who before I was a board member did a lot of speaking over there, um, <laughs> I just would hope that you guys could try to be succinct just because everybody wants to be heard and I want to hear everybody. Okay. I, I think what I'm hearing is uh, maybe don't limit the time, but we're going to ask um, you, the citizens that are in this room and in other rooms to do a couple of things. Make sure that you are keeping to the time limit. If you can, shorten up and have the same point, please do. Additionally, what I did note is that it looks like there may be more than one person from a family a uh, couple of times on this list. Perhaps come up together. Please be conscientious when you are speaking and when you are being a listener as well. Sometimes there's a lot of clapping and cheering and I know it's a, it, you wanna praise that person for being up here but that actually makes it take longer to get the next person up here. So please keep that in mind as well. Um, and then I think we can get everybody in tonight. We may have to take a break because sometimes sitting for two, well, several hours can be tough. So um, just keep patient. I know this room is warm, okay? All right, Mrs. McCabe, would you like to read our uh, citizens comment policy, please? Could we also maybe have whoever's um, managing a copy of the list have the next person ready 
especially if they're coming yes. from other rooms, that would be helpful for everybody. They do have a copy of the list, so they're sorry. The school code provides for a public comment period at each board meeting subject to reasonable constraints. The practice of this board is to limit public comment to three minutes per speaker to a total of 30 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. Speakers addressing the board are expected to maintain a reasonable level of civility and also personnel matters are sensitive and confidential. Comments regarding individuals should be respectful. Insults and defamatory remarks have no place in this setting. The board will terminate public comment if speakers cannot adhere to these guidelines. Please identify yourself at the beginning of your remarks. Okay, first one up, Mitch Bridges. Hello, my name is Mitch Bridges and I am a concerned citizen and parent of District 303 students. I'm here to talk about the company and program Deep Equity, not to be confused with the word equity. You see many people, including some members of this board are trying to make the claim that equity is not the same as critical race theory. And to them, I agree. However, we're not talking about the word equity. We're talking about a company, a business, a program called Deep Equity, not the word. This company is a tool to implement the very divisive and very political idea and teachings of critical race theory in our schools. Deep equity is confusing you and the public by calling it culturally responsive teaching in the literature, but this is semantics and worse, it's political rhetoric. Any company that buckets children and teachers into groups of oppressed and oppressors based on the color of their skin is wrong and quite frankly, it's racist. Administration was to conduct an audit, which Please never happened. Instead of demanding this audit, certain board members chose to approve the deep equity contract anyway. You took an oath to help provide unity in a safe space for learning and growth for all children of District 303. Your actions do not reflect that oath when you do not hold this administration accountable to do its job. The administration is essentially trying to subcontract out their responsibilities. They make a lot of money and I for one think they should have to do their job or perhaps you should think seriously about replacing them. Test scores have been in decline since this administration was signed on, and now we have this to further distract from academics. Look around, look outside. Is this bringing our community together? This is extremely divisive, and it's exceptionally political. It's not too late. Hold this administration accountable. Cancel the contract with deep equity. Do the equity audit. Handle any equity issues on an individual basis and keep race out of it. And please seriously consider replacing this administration with one that will focus on academics, on providing an elite educational opportunity and a bright future for all our children. In my hand, I hold ink signatures on paper petition where community members living in our district felt compelled enough to get in their car and drive to us to sign asking for your board members to cancel the deep equity contract today. We have Mr. 619 sig signatures to present. Mr. Burgess, your time is up, thank you. Do the right thing. Melissa Ignash. Hello, my name is Elisa Ignash, and I'm here to urge this school board to terminate the deep equity contract with District 303. Everyone in this room is in support of equity. The point in question here is not equity, but do we know what specific needs for equity to address? And the answer is no, we do not, because we never did the equity audit. The protocol for this decision was not followed. The cart came before the horse in this scenario. This is our chance to pause and reapproach the issue correctly. Let's not miss this opportunity. I am asking this board to first terminate the deep equity contract, second, to complete an equity audit so that we can identify our needs, and finally, find the appropriate resources to address those specific needs. Dr. Pearson made me aware of a state report card that requires this district to check an equity box. On that point, I would like to ask one last question. What are the alternatives specifically to the deep equity company? I ask that a less controversial equity solution be considered. I ask that a company without a precedent for creating hostile and divisive communities present to District 303. This parent is in support of terminating the deep equity contract today. Thank you. Olivia Nubo. Hi, my name is Olivia Nubo. I often reflect on my time at the three schools I went to within the district, beginning in 2004 at Coron, then to Haynes, and ending at St. Charles North High School, graduating in 2016. 
I remember about a year or so ago, I was having a conversation with my brother who's two grades above me in school. And we reminisced on our time at Corn Elementary School when he suddenly, it dawned on him and he asked me, do you remember Slave Day? And the memories came back in an instant. And I did remember Underground Railroad Day or more commonly known among students as Slave Day. One day a year when every fifth grade student cut holes into the Hanes white tees, added red marker to imitate blood and rubbed dirt on their freshly pressed clothes to pretend to be a slave. While I know that the teachers at Koran and the other elementary schools meant no ill will by this, their own biases and perspectives blinded them from being able to understand for quite some time why this practice was categorically wrong. Why it wasn't okay for teachers to dress and act as slave masters and for parents to volunteer as plantation managers. What seemed to be nothing more than an enriching, engaging activity in the moment for the majority left the minority feeling confused, hurt, and uncomfortable. During my sophomore year of high school, my health teacher, Mr. Prentice, once pulled me into the hallway prior to class to explain to me that something we would be talking about in health class had to do heavily with race. While I thought I was simply getting a warning that things were bound to get uncomfortable, Mr. P proceeded to give me the choice between him going on with this lesson or using a backup plan if I felt too uncomfortable. I vividly remember feeling so seen, respected, and valued as a member of our classroom community because our leader took the time to consider my differences. He understood that while I was a part of the classroom community, I did not share the same majority viewpoint and bias. While I commend Mr. P for his ability to see the greater picture and have thanked him again and again, this is one of the few times during my schooling experience where I felt that the difference in race was not being blatantly ignored to avoid discomfort. What's uncomfortable isn't being one of the white heads to turn and look at your black classmates while all learning about slavery for the first time. It's being that black classmate the only black classmate, while your teachers pretend not to notice the stairs being burnt into you. What's uncomfortable isn't having to teach about our nation's true history, but choosing to use phrases like the blacks with a tone of disgust, despite your one black student begging you to change your vocabulary. What's uncomfortable isn't being the majority, but being the minority, feeling like nothing but the token black kid and a stat booster for standardized tests. When I was away to college and I began to learn about social justice and equity-based practices in education, I began to scrutinize my schooling experience. Things that I had just written off as part of life were actually extremely damaging to my character and developing sense of self. I didn't and wouldn't have realized how categorically wrong my experiences were if I didn't understand the unconscious biases and beliefs that I carried with me throughout my life. This is why I urge you to keep deep equity in play within this district. I know that D303 is full of caring, intentional, loving leaders like Mr. Prentice, but he would not have been able to make the decision to give me a choice had he not known what biases he was living with. We can't do better if we don't know better. This practice only helps to uncover ways to improve as a collective. Mrs. Rubin, your time is up. Thank you. I had a petition signed by over a thousand community members and other concerned um, people that just wanted to share their voices as well. So I just wanted to give you all that number. It was over 1,100 people that agreed with me. So thank you. PJ Pinnex. Hello. Um, some of you may remember me, but or you may not remember me, but my name is TJ Pinex. I'm an incoming senior at SEN. And uh back in February, I spoke at an LNT meeting and expressed my own experiences, concerns regarding issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Furthermore, I also expressed my hopes of creating a club that is Project P. My bad. <laughs> okay. As of May of 2020, can you hear me? Okay. As of May of 2021, I am now one of the founding members of Project Peace, an organization that includes all, a club that promotes love, initiates learning together, and most importantly, one of the main focuses based on the key components of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dating back to, a, uh, to previous school board meetings, a common theme was student voices pleading for the continuation of the deep equity contract and, meet, and uh, those key components I mentioned earlier as well. Later on, we were joyful that the uh, deep equity program was voted a yes. However, it drew immense pain knowing that the vote was only four to three, barely passing. You would expect each member to have responded with a strong affirmation. However, that was not the case. We eventually noticed that this would become a long struggle and intense battle to revoke the contract that greatly improves the quality of life of all students in D303. According to IllinoisPolicy.org, the Illinois State Board of Education adopted new standards to prepare future educators to teach diverse students to foster classroom and school environments with 
every student feeling that they belong. I feel that deep equity or a program like deep equity, such as National Equity Project or Education Advisory Board puts us in position to be ahead of the curve when it comes to leading the way for culturally responsive teaching. Yes, deep equity may be relatively a new program, but other districts such as Naperville, Lake Zurich, and Batavia all gave positive feedback and continue their work with the program. Um, also, we, we struggle to comprehend the dis dismissal of deep equity. Imagine moving in the right direction one moment, but only to backpedal in the opposite direction months later. What for? I felt silence, we felt silence, and we still feel silence to this, to this second. If anything, we have the greatest impact. Our cries weren't hope, it were, were loud, sorry. Our cries were ignored. <laughs> our cries were ignored. Isn't the model of our school district to showcase the, uh, showcase the people in the programs of D303? Okay, last thing. During last month of school, I had an encounter with, with a substitute teacher whom I've known on many different occasions. Suddenly he comes up to me and says, hey, you're that fast kid from the track meet last night. In complete understanding, because I knew exactly who he thought I was, I responded, sorry, you got the wrong person. I don't do track. Um, he goes on to say, oh, I could have sworn that was you. And I was like, oh, no, that must have been someone else. He happens to be another student in our school, one of the very few African-Americans here. Um, the substitute teacher had mistaken me for another student. Not a big problem. You know, it wasn't that serious. I mean, he's human and he made a mistake. But what made him assume? Your time is up, right. Mr. Penix. Thank you. <laughs> Becky Gross or Groff? Good evening. My name is Becky Groth. My husband, Eric, and I are in the various stages of raising our eight kids within the school district boundaries. Um, this is our son, Manny, and our daughter, Rachel. They're a month apart in age. They refer to themselves as the twins. Manny was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Rachel was born in Aurora, Illinois. This is also our daughter, Rachel and her fiance, Noah. It is very important to me that you see these pictures because it is important to me that you hear what deep equity would mean to my family and other families like mine. Deep equity would demand that Rachel and her other six siblings see themselves as harborers of hate toward their brother. Deep equity would demand that they feel guilt and shame about their white skin and the supposed inherent violence that skin does to their brother. Deep equity would demand that Manny see his entire family as oppressors. Deep equity would demand that Manny question every interaction he has with us, his family, as potentially racist in intent and origin. Deep equity would demand that our family believe lies about each other. I ask you, how does a family survive this kind of evil? How do Rachel and Noah raise their future children in the face of an ideology that makes their mother an oppressor? How do they send their kids to a school that will teach them to see half of their family as an er inherently and irredeemably racist? I want you to picture Manny and Rachel sitting in a fourth grade classroom at Fox Ridge Elementary School when that was our neighborhood school. I want you to listen as they are taught that they are actually enemies, not the twins. They can't trust each other. They may think they love each other, but in reality, Rachel is a 10 year old oppressor who thinks her brother is beneath her because of his beautiful, black Haitian skin. Can you see their 10 year old faces? Can you hear their 10 year old innocence in their hearts shattering? Can you feel their 10 year old confusion and sorrow? I can, and I am so very thankful they never had to experience that kind of assault on their relationship or their family. Please show courage. Don't continue this in the D303 school system. We aren't the only family that would be damaged by this poison. There are other Manny's and Rachel's and Noah's and their families out there who love each other. Don't ruin that by calling that love into question. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Janik. Guys. Amy Janik. Hi, 
Hi, my name is uh, Amy. I've been an educator for 25 years. I have a master's in mathematics. So um, I'm coming to you both as a parent of a child in the district and also as an educator. Um, trends in education come and go, such as new math, no child left behind, common core. You all voted for those. They, I'm Jared, sorry. Can you please go for now? Thank you. You all, you all voted for those and they've all failed. All of them have failed. What's the problem with deep equity, you might ask? The districts who have adopted deep, deep equity, nearly every single one in the entire country who's adopted this has also adopted critical race theory. That is a pathway. You are creating a pathway when you, when you go ahead and adopt this. This, what critical race theory wants to do is level the playing field. If you look long-term, what has critical race theory done in Oregon, Washington, California, Virginia, um, Colorado, they've eliminated all AP classes until 11th grade. Why? When you, when you dumb down our curriculum, you're also making those kids who have special needs, they have to come up and rise to something they're not ready and they're not capable of doing. Deep equity is a doorway into this kind of thinking. You're going to take a child who's a freshman in high school who could probably be taking calculus who will not be allowed to take it because of critical race theory. You need to start looking long-term for this stuff. And this has been in California for over 10 years. I would like to see a longitudinal study that is done on critical race theory that is a benefit to our children. It's not, there's not. In fact, the Educational Research Journal shows in the educational field of specifically the critical race theory was adopted as a framework that emphasizes the centrality of race, racism and white supremacy in describing educational structures and social practices. CRT's role in education research typically adheres to foundational tenets briefly described. Challenges dominant frameworks and ideologies that are white supremacists in origin. Please tell me in District 303, what, what, what ideologies do we have that are white supremacist in an origin? And if so, you pass them. What are they? Lastly, this contract you spent and have allocated what some four hundred thousand dollars. It's fifty grand to cancel the contract. So therefore, you have three hundred fifty thousand dollars left. What are you going to do with that money if you cancel the contract? I have a strong suggestion. You need to hire people to help with the mental stability of our students. They have a COVID learning gap. We have to test them, and you have to see where they are. You have more students. Please let her speak. You have more students who are coming in when we have over two hundred percent increase in suicide rates in depression and anxiety, that money is better spent. And I can tell you now, nobody behind will tell you that mental health support would be wiped off the table. We need that for our kids. They've been in school six weeks. In one year, they've been in school six weeks. And you'd rather spend my money on deep equity rather than mental health specialists for these poor kids. I was told that my son coming in as a freshman might be one of less than 20 kids who's been in school all year long. Spend the money on our kids, not this garbage. Thank Your you. Time is up. Thank you. Lori Mueller. Lori Mueller. No, Lori Mueller. Hi, my name is Lori Mueller. I spoke at the February session. I gave you a variety of resources that spoke specifically on alternative thinking relative to critical race theory. What I'd like to talk to you about now as you're reconvening and re-looking at this is there's an immediate COVID learning gap and we need to address it. We have in District 303 graduating seniors at a rate of 51 and 57% reading proficiency one out of every two essentially unprepared with reading in, in our district going out. Is that a district that we want and people are gonna come moving to? You might wanna take a step back. We might wanna look at our administration and what they're referring to here. I don't have any thoughts or perspectives other than let's start with doing the evaluation that we committed to in March, looking at what the implications are, what we need to do, and then make a decision on what we're gonna do to address the issues that we see. We've got the cart before the horse. We need to understand what the implications of the last year and a half have been on our children. Let's focus in on our reading, our writing, our math, 
our sciences and making sure that every child in this district gets the education that we as taxpayers are actually paying for. We don't need things that distract from that particular motive. If we have teachers who are not treating our students in an appropriate, pleasant, positive, constructive way, let's deal with them from a human resources perspective. As an HR professional for 30 years in the business world, we would have never tolerated some of the stories that I've heard from these students. That would have been addressed at an individual level, not by this. It should have not been tolerated. Not tolerated. Mrs. Mueller, That's you're speaking to us, resources please. issue, not a deep equity, critical race theory issue. Address those individuals. We have awesome teachers in this school district. We have awesome staff in this school district. We need to respect them and respect and address those people. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Olivia, Courtney. Olivia, Courtney. Sorry, I'm not very good with public speaking. Um, but hi, my name is Olivia Folks Courtney. I'm a junior at St. Joseph High School. As a member of the student body, student council, and an athlete at the volleyball program, I believe that deep equity is needed in this district. Last year before school started, TJ, who is my cousin, and I were walking in the school next to each other and a teacher yelled at us to social distance because he assumed that we were not in the same household because we had different skin, co skin color. That felt uncomfortable okay. to both of us because we were family. When a white person is staying next to their white relative, people don't even question it. Now imagine if you were put in that same situation. When people look at us in the hallway or we drive out of the parking lot together, or I cheer for him at sporting events. To me, that is supporting family, but to other people, that looks weird because we're two different races. Imagine not even be able to support your family just because you look different. Imagine the looks you might get from not only the student body, but faculty or administration. How can you be okay with wanting a safe environment for everyone? when everyone doesn't feel safe to be who they are or who they want to become. You ask us to take these survey, surveys year and year and time and time again on bullying or how we feel at school because you want to create a safe environment for everyone. But does that everyone include minorities who feel that they cannot answer freely because we have a majority white administration or student body? I believe that everyone, that anyone and everyone can be biased about anything. But when people are not taught to look at it in a different way or learn about it and learn about it from a different way, how can they give an unbiased opinion? I believe this program will help people learn to look at it from a different perspective, not because they can ever truly, truly ever understand what minorities go through every day, but because it will help the minorities feel safe in a place that everyone, no matter what they look like, should feel safe. I think that most people here not to speak for them, but I also believe that some people here are talking the racial side of deep equity. My family who is white, my step or my mom who is white, my stepdad who is black, and my cousin TJ here who is black, and my step siblings who are black. We love each other and embrace our cultures. We see no no hate to each other by learning about black culture in school and from my family's experiences. They do not hold it to us because we are white and we do not look down on them because they're black. We look up to them because of the experience that they have had to go through, not only in the school district, but in this country. And I know we're not talking about the country right now, um, but in our district. And also it's not just about racial, it's about the kids with the IEPs, the kids who, the kids who do not Ms. speak Courtney, English. Your time is up, thank you. Sophia Barada. Ma'am. Thank you. 
My name is Sophia Barada, but today I'm going to be speaking on behalf of Vincent He, an incoming senior at St. Charles North who could not be here to give this speech today. To the respectable members of the school board, my parents immigrated to this country from China in the summer of 1998. This is summarizing the journey and effort it took them to achieve this feat in very simple terms. To journey across half the world, they had to achieve scores in the 90th percentile on the Gaokao, the Chinese college entrance exam, in order to be considered for higher education. This is comparable to only scores of 1340 and above on the SAT being considered for college in the States. Likewise, throughout their journey to the United States that they experienced difficulties in attaining a visa just to go to school in America due to so many applic applicants also fighting for that pass into a country with a better education. Throughout this whole journey, they were able to mature into people representative of the ideals of America no matter what prejudice and bias they face, because my parents did indeed meet a lot of bias in their journey. People have spat at and refused to work with my parents because of their status as a minority people in the USA. There were also times where I myself have faced bias in my life, whether it was in public or even in my education. But luckily, there are programs and tools designed to limit the amount of bias that I see in my life. I am of course talking about deep equity, a program designed to help D303 faculty members uncover their subconscious bias and become better educators. I believe deep equity will create better environments where students can feel more included because no matter how much they try, I could only see my teachers as different people no matter how much they identified with me. I've always felt that they treated me as an outside part of a classroom, whether it be trying to put me with groups that they felt were similar in the classroom or even talking about topics that related to my culture in a lighter context compared to the other ones in my classroom. I felt that no one knew about who I was on the inside, a Chinese American citizen. My teachers shared the American part, but I feel that because they never really understood or even acknowledged the Chinese part, that subconscious bias impeded on any relationship I could have had with many teachers in my life. However, with deep equity, teachers can remove these slight biases and allow students to be able to communicate in an easier environment with their teachers. I genuinely believe that bias in the classroom infringes on my fellow students' education, and by removing this bias, it is ensured that students will continue to receive the top-notch education that we can expect from the D303 school district. I think I can speak for all of us students when we say that our teachers are one of the most important factors in sculpting a student into something greater, and I believe that deep equity can be a tool that should be added to a teacher's inventory that will help them achieve great success in sculpting a better classroom. My parents fought to live and thrive in this country, and I understand that many people in the community are attempting to thrive as well, but with deep equity, the struggle to be better students and live better lives is made so much easier than continuing to live a life where students may miss out on a better education Mr. because Honor. they are misunderstood. Your time is up. Thank you. Aaron Mannheim. Hello, my name is Erin Mannheim, and tonight I am speaking to you as a lifelong resident of St. Charles, having attended Lincoln, Thompson, and St. Charles High School, a D303 parent of two children who attended Wild Roads this past year, and as an individual teacher with 20 years experience at St. Charles North High School. I have tried to listen as people I deeply respect have given their rationale for why deep equity would be a negative experience for our schools. I think it stems from a more emotional response, a fear, or a worry for our children. The word divisive has been mentioned and guilt or misunderstood has been fretted over. I think at the root of this fear we're seeing now that somehow deep equity, with that our white children will somehow feel a sense of indignation or shame, that they have their own struggles, that they can't help that they were born white. And all of that is true, end of sentence. So now let's move to my teaching experience. My second year teaching, I had a student come to me and tell me they were going to miss a test on Wednesday. And I said, okay, great, you can take the test on Tuesday. The student looked me directly in the eye and said, I shouldn't have to miss a test just because I'm Jewish. And I was gobsmacked. I had never realized, never even thought about in my entire time living in St. Charles that every single Christian student had every single holy holiday off as a non-attendance day and every other religion had to use a prearranged absence form. I shifted. My fifth year teaching, a student wanted to start a gay straight alliance at North and had turned in all the forms and asked me with shaking hands and shaking voice if I would be their advisor. The courage he was displaying, I had never known that that was even a thing you had to feel because I had always just been accepted. Then 10 years into my teaching, 
a student told me that they were going to be gone for the entire month of December. And having grown up in St. Charles and been teaching for 10 years, I knew it was up. You got good flights in the beginning of December. Why couldn't you just use the dates that we gave you off? Then the student had to look at me again and say, no, that's the month that I go see my family and my dad needs to re renew his visa. Again, my paradigm shifted. All of those things happened and I'm grateful for them. The common experience in all of those though, is that a student felt safe enough with me to confront my misunderstanding and then trusted that I would respond to them in a culturally sensitive manner. I never once felt guilty that I was white during this experience or that I was from St. Charles during these experiences. After my initial shock at being so blind, my caring, responsible, lifelong learner came out and all I felt was gratitude. Gratitude that these children had felt safe and trusted me enough to teach me, but it shouldn't have to be a singular child that holds that burden to teach me. I want to learn with my colleagues. Let me be vulnerable and grow. More so, I want there to be a supported group of students who are leaders that help and guide us, not as individual brave voices, but as supported and empowered group of voices. That's the YES program with Deep Equity. That group of voices is important. I know deeply how hard it can be to be a board member, how tiresome it can become. So when you feel deep down, you usually go back to the students. The students are using their voices now. Your Please time listen is up. to them. Thank you. Andy Belafast, Andy Belafast. My name is Andy Belafast. When I was here last month at the learning and, and teaching committee meeting, and this is a follow up. And then we got involved, I got involved last month because citizens had come to the St. Charles Veterans and asked for our assistance in opposing deep equity. Now I'm not here representing the St. Charles Veterans Center. In fact, I kind of changed what I was gonna say listening to folks talk here. I'm here giving a different perspective, just a veteran's perspective. I'm gonna tell you that when you're digging a foxhole and the guy next to you is black and you're white, you really don't care what race he is. And when you're a, a, an infantry platoon leader like I was, and you're in charge of 32 men, and your platoon sergeant has 10 more years experience than you, and treats you with deep respect, and takes care of your, and covers your back, and he's black, you get a different perspective on life. I'm just gonna tell you that American society is not racist. It's not racist. I think that whiteness is not where we need to be. I think that we need to be talking about being Americans. The perspective of your average veteran, and this is based on my discussions with many veterans, is that critical race theory has no, no place in American schools. I do not know if Corwin Deep Equity is based on deep equity or on, on, on critical race theory. I don't know that. I have not seen the teaching material. I understand this is going to be taught to teachers who's going to use it uh, in their, their da daily lives or in their daily exercises as professional development. I will simply say I looked at the Deep Equity website. There's a lot of hints that it links this critical race theory. It does not mention critical race theory. Also, Gary Howard's book, his flagship book, there is no mention of critical race theory, but that book makes it very clear that uh, critical race theory is, is fundamental to his beliefs. I don't know, I have not been exposed to the material that your teacher, your educators are going to be exposed to. It's been kept pretty close to the vest, but I can only make a correlation between what Gary Howard has written and those principles are based on critical race theory. And without knowing what's in the curriculum or your, your teaching materials, that there is a correlation. And I look forward to getting a look at those materials, being exposed to those materials. And I hope that we can find common ground. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Dwayne Boo. Dwayne Boo or Bo. Dwayne.
Good evening. I'm Dwayne Butel, a 43 year citizen resident of St. Charles. My two adult children are graduates of St. Charles schools, Lincoln, Haynes and St. Charles High School now known as East. I'm here tonight as a concerned citizen, a concerned veteran, and as a concerned grandparent of five school aged grandchildren. Like I suspect some board members and many in the audience, I have considerable concerns about deep equity and its relationship to critical race theory. Also, I suspect like you, I am concerned about the current divisiveness and the all too present anger and frustration that we all witness on our nightly news and in our daily newspapers and too often on the streets of our major cities. I'm troubled that although perhaps well-intentioned, Adding deep equity to our school curriculum would add to the divisiveness in our community and to our school curriculum. Do we really think that once introduced that we can keep control of these programs? As a good friend of mine, a person with a doctorate in education reminded me, once the classroom door closes, discussion of topics best left out of the classroom become extremely problematic for the teacher and often troublesome to young minds. It would be a major mistake not to recognize and understand the connection between deep equity and racial uh, critical race theory and related social movements. When introduced, some were appealing to most open-minded people. However, it didn't take long to discover that the destruction and even death in some of our major cities was directly tied to a seemingly well-intended movement, which unfortunately, but perhaps predictably failed us. Please do not allow questionable social programs and programming into our schools. The well being of our children and teachers is too precious and important to allow them to become embroiled in controversial teaching and training with goals aimed at dismantling dubious social disparities. And do not be fooled by expert scholarly elitists with all of the answers to cure our social ills. If we have learned nothing else from COVID, I hope that we have learned that too often the social and special scholarly experts are mistaken. Thank you. Tracy Ramondo. Tracy Ramondo. All right. I'm Tracy Ramondo. Um, people are up here talking about perspective. I am a female. Marine Corps veteran and a gay mom to an eight-year-old girl in the school district. If you guys want to talk about a difficult road, try taking that path. Back when I was in school, I was never taught that I should treat people the same regardless of color of their skin. I wasn't taught that because in the 80s and 90s when I grew up, we had already moved past the superficial concept of judging people by the color of their skin. Also their sexual identity and gender. So I ask you, how did we get to this point? CRT teaches teachers and students that people learn differently based on their color, their gender, their gender identity, and their culture. This is not a new concept. Teachers all over the world have known that all kids don't learn the same way and that they each need to be taught how they learn. But understanding the learning process it takes to teach kids is not about teaching them that they are not capable. It's about teaching them that they are strong. It's not about pointing out their differences. It's about pointing out how we are all the same. If we start teaching children that they are not as good as other kids because of superficial differences, we're going backwards. No kid deserves to hear that because they are different, they are less than another. No kid deserves to hear that just because they are one color or another that their life is somehow easier. Yes, there are black kids who live in poverty. There are also white. Yes, there are gay kids who are beat up on the street. There are also straight. Yes, there are kids who are abused without complete families living in poor neighborhoods. And yes, they are all different colors, sizes, cultures, so sexual identities. Let's talk stats. 53% of Asians got a bachelor's degree in 2015. Only 32% of white Caucasians did. And 22.5% of blacks had obtained one. Gays were not on the list, so, but I got a master's degree. So I don't think... Uh, Ever in my life, I used my sexual preference as a reason I have accomplished or have not accomplished something. I've always come to the top. 
How in the world in a system that you call systemically racist towards all different cultures and colors did 53% of Asians and 22.5% of black students overcome this terribly racist culture that you talk about? How did they succeed when the rules in the system are supposedly against them every step of the way? I'm tired of the other side's argument. They hurt and shame others who disagree with them. So many people came to me and others voicing their opposition to this deep equity program, but were terrified to come forward for fear of retribution and hate, fear of losing their jobs, fear of being labeled. I find it funny that the very people who are speaking out about why we should have CRT and why it is important not to label people or judge them by the color of their skin, their sexual identity or gender are the very people who are doing the labeling and judging. Please let her finish. Stop deep, stop deep equity, it only segregates us further. Thank you. Carla McLuso, Carla McLuso, McAluso, Carla. Oh. I'm Carla McLuso, really hard to follow that up. So I just wanna be clear, I believe we're all here for equality, but equality and equity are opposite. Equity means everyone has the same outcome at the finish line. Equality is everyone having the same opportunity at the starting line. This is social engineering and has no place in our schools. At the last board meeting, no one could really define equity. We know the definition now, it's racism. Geneva, District 303 stopped this at their door. They had the foresight and intelligence to prevent this divisive and discriminatory program from ever entering their school and their community. A Geneva board member told me they would not want to put their students and families through this chaos and division. Look what's happening here. Don't you think the divisiveness will happen with the students? This is causing division, not helping it. I viewed the workbook. There was only one workbook. We were allowed 20 minutes. However, this was not the training manual or the disks associated with each chapter. In the foreword, it says, this is a long-term systemic roadmap. Be change agents, AKA activists, part of a larger manual, multi-year process. They hook you in for many years to prevent the exit. Chapter two description says, white social dominance, social justice, talk about racism. Chapter five says, systemic transformation. You said you wanted politics out of this. This is politics all day, every day. Social justice all day, every day. Where is the actual learning and improved test scores? This for-profit program has a goal of seeing race first. This author, Gary Howard, wrote a book, How Are We White? He says the goal is to root out white privilege, moving from white dominance to acknowledging our racism and to work to dismantle the legacy of dominance. This doesn't belong in our school. In Japan and China, Students have to test to get into middle school and high school, but here we're more concerned about being woke than we are about the sliding SAT scores and the rigor in learning. The online DO3, D3, O3 FAQs are written so poorly they must be taken down. You make really big statements like the data driving this recommendation, the need for equity, blah, blah, blah. Where's the proof? Quantitative and qualitative evidence. Show us the evidence. Every single thing you write, there's no links, there's no footnotes, there's no anything to prove any of it. So I want that taken down. 84% of our taxes goes to education. Teach kids how to think, how to critically think, not what to think. Get rid. Please let get, her finish. She only has three minutes. All right. The last thing I wanted to say is, this seems to be more damaging than COVID-19. There's no antidote for this other than getting rid of it. Parents don't want it, teachers don't want it, and you work for us. Lauren Carter. Hi, my name is Lauren Carter. Um, my pronouns are super. I'm the parent of two D303 elementary students. Um, and I wrote a whole thing that I was gonna read. Um, and I've emailed it to you as well. I'm not gonna read it because I've had conversations with friends here in red shirts um, and strangers. And um, it's got me thinking about this a little bit differently. So what I'd like to say is that there's been a lot of talk about race and how um, racism is part of this conversation, which I very much agree with. 
However, it is not just equity for racial groups. It is also equity for different, different categories and subgroups like the LGBTQ community, like different socioeconomic standings. And that's something I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, I barely graduated high school. I barely made it out, both with my life and with my diploma. I remember at graduation walkthrough, my student counselor came up to me and she said, you made it, you got a C in that last class and you're gonna graduate with someone else tomorrow. And the reason that I barely made it through with a father who's a professor at a university and a mother who's a teacher is I experienced some pretty intense trauma throughout my high school career. And had my teachers had some kind of training, some sort of framework to be able to identify what my individual experience was, then perhaps they would have had the tools to help support me. And as a parent, I have already, my kindergartner who is going to be in first grade, I've already gone to bat for him at preschool, the preschool level, he was experiencing bullying because as a small child, he likes to show up to school in unicorn outfits. And for Halloween, he dressed up as Linda the Good Witch because who doesn't love a big fun pink dress and a bubble? Um, and the kids teased him mercilessly. Um, I talked to the preschool about having more inclusive conversations, having their children be open to different, different gender norms and the way that kids express themselves and now my child is afraid to go to first grade after a year of e-learning because of his asthma. He doesn't want to go back in person school because he remembers that bullying in preschool so acutely. So what is D303 going to provide to the teachers to support my child as he grows through this system? How will I know that he will remain safe? How will I know that he will be able to focus on his schoolwork while not being in survival mode. This is not just about some idea of critical race theory. It is bigger than that. Thank you. Danelle Vanda Sample. Ms. Vanda Sample. Good evening. My name is Del Vandesample. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a D303 parent and taxpayer, as well as a D303 teacher. The thoughts I am sharing tonight are my own. Deep equity is not critical race theory being taught to students, nor does it represent a content or skill outcome for students directly. Instead, it is focused on providing teachers with a framework for culturally responsive teaching in which each student's unique heritage, identity, and perspective is celebrated and used to connect that student to learning and to the community. It is focused on achieving equity through a focus on relationships, responsiveness, and rigor. I too had an opportunity to review the Deep Equity Workbook when it was made available. What I found was a clear professional development framework designed to support teachers and administrators in reflecting on how they create educational environments and systems that promote excellence for all students. Equity is about doing what we can to ensure that each child who comes through our doors feels a sense of safety, acceptance, and belonging, and is able to achieve that potential. Equity, be, equity is about examining what I might subconsciously be doing that gets in the way of these goals and making a commitment to do better. Equity is about examining the structures or systems that get in the way of those goals and making a commitment to do better. We all want the same for our children. We want them to be safe. We want teachers to see them as the amazing, unique individuals that they are. We want them to be valued for who they are. We want them to be happy. We want them to be treated with kindness and respect. We want them to feel as though they belong, that school is a place for them. We want them to be challenged and inspired to greatness. As a mother, I want this for all three of my children. As a teacher, I want to ensure that I am providing the same for all of your children and grandchildren, our children. I want to ensure that I am not unintentionally making a child feel unseen or disrespected or finding myself unsure of how to respond to an uncomfortable classroom conversation or viral video. I want to know how to support my students who are fasting during Ramadan or who are struggling with their teachers and substitutes, mispronouncing their names or misgendering them. 
or who are struggling with how to respond to racist, sexist, homophobic, or ableist language. I want our schools to be a safe place for all our children, and deep equity is beginning the training we as staff need in order to do better for all our children. I've heard we've put the, heart, the cart before the horse and that we need to wait for the audit. I disagree. We already have data presented to this board telling us that we are not meeting all of our students' needs. They do not all feel safe Please let her speak. and as though they belong. They are not all achieving at their full potential. Addressing these concerns begins with staff and how they interact with students. The audit may highlight other areas of need, but there is no doubt that we as teachers need to be the leaders in this work. I've heard this is too divisive or too political. Again, I disagree. Ensuring that our children all feel a sense of safety, acceptance, and belonging is not political. It is only divisive if we let it be. That flag is my flag too. We are constantly striving to create a more perfect union in our country. We all want better for our children than we have for ourselves. Let's do better for all our children. Thank you. President Barker, can you take a break, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, at this time, we're going to take a short recess. It is 8.02. We'll be back in five minutes.
Please be seated. Please be seated. Yeah. There we go. We're sitting. Please be seated. Okay, Miss Lori Nanini. Lori Nanini. I do need everyone to take a seat, please, quickly. Attention, please. The meeting start to begin again, please. I'm gonna have to. Taking a seat, please, quickly. Okay, Miss Nanini. Oh, she's on her way up. Okay. Hi, my name is Lori Nanini. Um, I was going to speak on behalf of my students. My student is not here, so they're going to speak. Hello, um, I am Elizabeth Nowak, and um, Mrs. Nanini was going to speak on behalf of me, but I ended up showing up. <laughs> As I was researching about deep equity, I realized there is very little on the internet about deep equity, like what it really is. All the summaries are wordy and challenging to interpret, not to mention difficult to process and access. I got most of the information off of St. Charles North Stargazer as it was more accessible than the district's challenging to interpret statement. Deep equity is all about uplifting students of all kinds, students of color, queer students, transgender students, impoverished, impoverished students, female students, and students of color, and queer students of, of all religions. They all deserve and need the same understanding as well as a deep understanding as much as that of a white, cisgender, heterosexual, wealthy male student traditionally gets. Let me paint a picture for you. A teen is walking through the halls at school. All is fine until they drop their phone and bend over to pick it up. Suddenly, many male students start catcalling the student, the sole purpose being that the teen bending over is a woman. The teacher doesn't know this or understand this, and they were never taught to deal with this. This is one of the many times that I have felt highly uncomfortable as a female-born student, as, one, as I was the one that was being catcalled. It was derogatory, and my self-esteem was lessened as I realized how many of the male peers perceived me. It was a very hard time focusing on my classwork the rest of the day. This, it, this impacts people like even more that has impacted me. There have been a few times where at the school environment that people have felt in world, like LGBTQ queer and questioning people have felt very unwelcomed. Health classes will continue to be extremely uncomfortable and irrelevant to queer students if the teachers only speak of heterosexual relationships. I know of people who do not get the help they needed as staff, staff members do not understand what it was like to be a queer teenager. I have had friends who requested a specific accommodation so that they could feel safe, yet a teacher decided not to give them the necessary accommodation to them until other students spoke up. On top of this, I've heard a few stories that include someone trying to figure out how to juggle schoolwork, a job, and how to support their parents in times of need. These situations have led to the decline of the student's mental health and a capability of, to be successful in school. The lack of diverse teachers, staff, and role models have not helped this case. Diverse role models can lead a positive imprint on students' lives. So most of all, if not all, students get the deep understanding. This is why deep equity is needed. Thank you. Matthew Janicek. Matthew Janicek. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Janicek. I'm a St. Charles resident and former District 303 student, Wild Rose Thompson and St. Charles High. I'm also speaking to you as a 22-year classroom veteran of American history and world history. Uh, my experience with deep equity and critical race theory began two years ago in our district, and it begins with establishing rules and norms. Uh, and the rules and norms for PLC meetings, we have to all agree to certain premises. If I can highlight an element of this, that's applicable on a day-to-day -day basis. It would be the word implicit bias. It's one of the first rules that we have to accept is implicit bias. And this expects that we accept that because of our race, I cannot fully empathize with another person from a different category. And 
this is presented to you as a non-negotiable truth. This is how it starts. And because I am unaware of my own bias, experts stand ready to explain to me where my biases come from and what I can do about it. Here's just one glaring flaw contained in the theory. It legitimizes one race by race and then delegitimizes another race by race. Young people that I teach see the hypocrisy. Oh. The slippery slope that we are on, the application of well-intended ideas is where the flaw is occurring. We all have the right end in mind, but what's happening is the flawed logic is being applied and putting kids in categories and they see themselves as categories first, subgroups first, and unified Americans last. They're being divided by culture, race, religion, gender, and socioeconomic status. We're helping do that. We need to stop. We are being told we have separate realities. We all have separate realities. Separate realities lead to separate rules. Separate rules become separate standards. Separate standards does not equal unity. So what I've seen in this... Please let him speak. Thank you. Sorry. What I've seen in the last year is a lot of the kids are waking up. They don't want to be patronized. They are frustrated that they are being lied to about a lot of different things. And they're not racist. Today's students are not racist. They believe in equality. At uh, the end of a Zoom meeting we had last year, put together a Black Panel Student Association. One of the questions given to the, the, the students was, uh, what do you want from your teachers? One of them said, just tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. Last thing I want to say, I was a product of this district. From Mrs. Wade, John Stock, Bob Graham, Charlie Bell, Ray Rogina, Buck Drock, John Vanko, Bob McBride, Kathy Brenz, Lori Drumtruck, Greg Munt, Diane Ring, Mark Gould, Mike Power. I can't name them all, you guys. These are St. Charles veterans that I loved. They taught me the values of right and wrong. Mr. Jim, okay. and your time I is up. I appreciate that. That's all. Thank you. Derek Crenshaw. My name is Derek Crenshaw. I'm a, a fellow teacher with Mr. Janicek. I'm originally from Inglewood, Chicago, killing foot fields of uh, Chicago. So just a little bit of our background. I want to start you off with a couple of things. I want to take this in a little a, a different direction right now. I don't want anybody to applaud for me when I'm done or when I'm talking. Toni Morris in 1988 said, race is real information, but tells you next to nothing about a person, okay? This deep, deep equity is digging into um, deciphering what a person's thinking before you get to know them. So that's one thing. Take the language back. I'm not a minority. Stop calling me a minority. Stop calling these kids minorities. Treat them as individuals and teach them to critically think. Deep, deep equity is not going to bring you together. You got red shirts and green shirts. And no matter my amount of evidence you try to tell these people or the other side, they don't want to hear it. But I will tell you, if you do your history and your research, the deep equity people that are for it, they're going to come for you one day, okay, or your kids, because they are not living the MLK, MLK dream, content of character, okay? Kids today don't have this problem. This is coming from way up top, and you got to really dig down deep and CRT in the language. I've been teaching 30 years, coaching and teaching. I've been all over the state. I've been the only black person many, many times. Okay, so I know what some of these kids do feel, but we can deal with those individual cases, case by case. Look up Dunbar High School from 1880 to 1955. You're gonna see a all black high school during the Jim Crow era that was an outstanding school. So tell me how they did it then and we can't do it now. The boards, the boards and the people for deep equity are good meaning people. They want to help the kids. I truly believe that. But I think they're coming from a situation where they're not getting all the information. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of things. Thomas Sowell is over 90 years old. He has been hidden from the American people. He's written a book called Discrimination and Disparities. A lot of people equate a discrimination or a disparity with discrimination. And that's not so. You gotta dig down to the data. 
there is discrimination in the world. There always will be, and we won't stop it. But if we understood uh, more about that, then we, we, we could deal with it. The fallacy detector, this board, if you want to teach your kids to critically think, this should be in every school in the country. It says 36 lessons on how to recognize bad reasoning. I was at U of I. I got my master's degree in, in administration. I flew the red, black, and green. That's uh, So you got to be an older person to understand the red, black, and green. That was uh, more of a Marxist ideology. Uh, Mr. Kunjo, so your time is up. Just real quick. Fallacy to Texas is one thing this group needs to get to the kids so they can debate and learn to critically think. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Carolyn Koikis. Hi, my name is Caroline Caracas. I've been asked to speak on behalf of several D303 teachers in order to give them a voice. And here's one of their letters. Uh, members of the board and senior leadership, I write this letter anonymously because I'm afraid, I'm afraid to publicly speak out against the deep equity program for fear of being labeled a racist, homophobe, or naive white supremacist. I am worried that if I do speak out, I'll be reprimanded, targeted, or shunned. I'm a taxpayer, parent, and educator in D303. So to say that I have a stake in this matter is an understatement. Since childhood, I've known St. Charles as a destination for families due to its reputation of great schools. As taxpayers, we put our faith in the school district to be wise stewards of our money by providing high quality staff facilities and curricular choices. As parents, we rely on the expertise of administrators and teachers to do what's best for our children. As an employee, I believed I was working in a school district that valued its reputation and the community it serves. However, it increasingly feels as if the reputation is foregone conclusion to senior leadership. The fact that critical race theory has been banned in several states along with deep equity seems to have no impact on the Board of Education or district level administrators and doesn't seem to be prompting a closer evaluation of the program and its roots. It doesn't take many clicks from the deep equity partners, sponsored links to happen upon radical organizations that blatantly tout Marxism and socialism. Yet none of these facts seem to give the Board of Education or Dr. Pearson reason to pause and reconsider. While the members of the boards are volunteers, you are elected volunteers, the members of the Board of Education and all the employees of D303 work for us and the taxpayers and res residents of this great city. Numerous parents contact me, uh, contacted me about deep equity and wonder why parents and teachers are not informed or consulted about the controversial program. Too many members of the community feel that the program is being purposefully pushed through without community knowledge. And almost everyone I spoke to heard about deep equity somewhere else. Saying it's posted on the board book is insufficient for an implementation of this importance and expense. Recently, I've seen parents and teachers of all colors and nationalities standing up against similar programs around the country. Deep equity will create a divide amongst our teachers, students, and community and diminish the progress we have made in our country's pursuit for a more perfect union. Training us as teachers to see students' race first is un-American. I refuse to evaluate any student by their color of their skin or gender or gender preference, but will help any student who is failing behind regardless of color. Rather than dividing us by our skin color, let us work to, re let's work to reunite as students as Americans who are proud of their country and appreciate the gifts and freedoms we enjoy as citizens and residents of this great, greatest country on earth. Thank you. The fact that this teacher, Please the fact that this teacher and several others feel they couldn't speak and have had me to do it is un-American and to silence their voices. Throughout history, those silencing voices end up on the wrong side of history. So please revoke this contract so we can study it better and figure out how to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Brunling. Alice Fromling. Alice Fromling. Hi, uh, my name is Alice Fromling. My pronouns are she, her. I've taught at North for 12 years and I'm the mother of two future D303 students. I speak today in strong support of maintaining the contract with Deep Equity, a support echoed by many of my colleagues. Uh, we've heard many reasons why the board should terminate its contract. Some are concerned because they say equity isn't a problem in our district. However, after hearing the impassioned words of our own students and alumni at board meetings throughout this year, clearly we have work to do. It's easy to argue that problems don't exist when you're on the winning side of inequity. 
I've also heard lots of I support equity, but or I'm totally for equity, but statements. Lots of buts. However, it seems like the board concerns with deep equity have been addressed. People are concerned that this program will shame students. We've been assured very clearly that this training and our teachers will not shame students. I still hear people questioning the curriculum being implemented. We've been assured this is not a curriculum. Some claim that deep equity teaches critical race theory. It doesn't. It's teaching culturally responsive teaching. There are arguments that we should be doing this work in-house, training Excuse ourselves me. on equity and inclusion, but we are simply not equipped to do that effectively. I've also heard concerns that the primary indicator of success or benchmark for concern should be test scores. And we've seen the quantitative data indicating disparities in test scores. You can go back and watch the videos of school board meetings. That criteria alone warrants action taken. However, as teachers, as administrators, and as board members, we are responsible for so much more than test scores. When we see students stand at this same microphone and share stories about being judged and misunderstood, about their classmates and teachers lacking in cultural competence, about hostile environments where bullying can flourish, we should be eager to improve. And since we have already signed a contract and begun training with a program that helps to address those issues directly, why are we even having a discussion now about stopping? When I see these concerns about deep equity continue to be brought up, concerns that seem answered and addressed, they start to feel like excuses. Excuses to take the easy way out, excuses to stall, drag our feet, and ultimately do nothing of real consequence to address this issue. We need to be better than that. We will do all of our students a disservice by terminating this training. Please seek feedback from administrators on how the training is going. Participate in the training yourselves. And then if the experience is somehow problematic, ensure you have another equity program lined up to replace it. The only shame that I see coming from this decision is the shame we should feel in listening to the pleas of our students and then leaving them with nothing, walking away from the commitment that was already made to them months ago. Please do the right thing. Thank you. I am going to ask for the last time that you remain respectful to the people who are speaking up here, even if you're pleased or not pleased. Allow them to speak, allow them to have their three minutes. Okay, Jennifer Bora, please. Jennifer Bora, and I teach English at St. Charles East. I'm advocating for the board to uphold this previous vote in favor of the contract with Deep Equity. The first time a student came up to me and said, Ms. Bora, I'm transgender. Can you help me tell the class what my pronouns are? I had no idea how to proceed, and I was terrified I would do or say the wrong thing. If you're wondering whether I could have asked a colleague for advice, you should know that I'm one of the advisors for our school's GSA, so I am that colleague. Each year, my co-advisor, a bunch of teenagers, and I get up in front of the rest of the staff and talk about how LGBT issues impact our students. I'm up there with good intentions, but being co-advisor of a club is not an actual qualification. It shouldn't be my job to train my co-workers, and it certainly shouldn't be the students. The fact is, though, that there's currently nobody else to do it. Well, why does anyone need to train teachers on how to support students with regards to gender, race, religion, or any other identity for that matter? Are these conversations we really need to be having in school? Well, if we want to just not talk about these issues in school, then somebody has to silence the students. They're coming to their teachers and starting these conversations, whether we're ready for them or not. The following three things were said to me by each student. One, being Mexican at this school is like wearing the same uniform as everyone else, only yours is always wrinkled and dirty. Two, other kids on my team made fun of my pronouns and I felt like I didn't belong. Three, my classmates were drawing swastikas on pieces of paper and stuffing them in my bag during class. That last one was said aloud to the entire East faculty. When a kid shares something like that, not talking about it isn't an option. I never know if what I say in response to these students is anywhere close to the right thing. It's that I rely on my gut feeling and a whole lot of guessing. A kid deserves a better than me guessing. I'm not trans. I'm not a person of color. I'm not an immigrant. I don't have a disability. Not having these identities 
doesn't make me a bad teacher, but it would make me an irresponsible one if I didn't seek out in favor of training on how to best support students whose identities and experiences differ from my own. I need help supporting my students, and so do my colleagues. I'm confident the Deep Equity Program can provide that. Please allow us to have access to the training we need. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Genevieve Zakas. Genevieve Zakas. Hello, board members. Uh, my name is Genevieve Zakis. My husband and I live in St. Charles, and I have been teaching at East for 10 years. In fact, I've had the pleasure of teaching many of your children. Though I should mention that the thoughts tonight that I share are my own. I went in last week to view the deep equity materials, and I was happy to see resources that could help teachers learn to support students of all races, religions, colors, genders, and sexualities. I've heard that the conversations among administrators who have undergone this training have been incredibly positive, and I'm here tonight to ask you to please keep deep equity. One comment I've heard in the debate over deep equity is that racism does not exist in our community. Unfortunately, my experiences in the classroom tell a different story. I have had to tell students to stop drawing swastikas on desks. I've had to make phone calls home, explaining why a child cannot write his research paper about how transgender students belong in concentration camps. Most importantly, and most tragically, I then have to comfort my students of color when they witness these actions and no longer feel safe in my classroom. I'm repulsed by the discrimination our students experience, and I want better for them. Teachers want to do their best to support all students, but we need professional training on this. It cannot fall on our teachers of color or our GSA club advisors, or perhaps most inappropriately of all, our students who have been harmed to train us. We need to do this work so that every student in our schools feels safe and valued, and we need Deep Equity's help. The unfortunate reality is that our students of color and LGBTQ plus students have to carry their identities into the classroom with them every day, whether they want to or not. Race is already a part of the classroom experience for them. By not learning to acknowledge and appreciate the unique identities students bring to the classroom, we as a primarily white faculty continue to create harm. I ask that you please act in favor of our students, many of whom have spoken here tonight and made their viewpoints clear. Carolyn Weibel all regularly mentions that you as a board have a sworn commitment to equity. I hope that, you, that all of your actions will align with this value and that you will vote to keep this program. Thank you for standing strong and for fighting for all of our students. Masha Kadishak. Masha Kadishak. My name is Masha Kadishak. And I hate masks because they're stuffy and I can't breathe in them. I also hate masks because you can't tell anyone apart. Like at the beginning of the school year, most of my teachers had to identify me by my name tag. But if we didn't have masks, my teacher could easily recognize me by, by my face and how it looks. Masks could also give infections and pimples. Because of the masks, because of the masks, I couldn't identify my friends' emotions. At school in PE, they tell us to wear a mask in gym and I get hot and sweaty in my mask. What if I was wearing a cloth mask and didn't have another one? Would I have to wait through the whole school day to take a hot and sweaty mask off? Think about how gross that would be. I love school, but the fact that I have to wear a mask six hours a day made me not want to go to school at all. I had to spend a whole year like that. So the person who made that choice, do you want... Do you really want kids like me suffer, to suffer wearing stuffy masks and getting breathing problems and face infections? Ask yourself that question. At least think about it. Also, when most teachers are fully vaccinated, there's 0% of us kids getting or transmitting COVID. Why do you make us suffer? Please make a better decision. Thank you for listening to Why I Hate Masks. Thank you. 
Marina Schusterman. Marina Schusterman. My name is Marina Schusterman. I have three children in the group here. We moved to Illinois seven years ago. We had the option to live anywhere within 50 miles of Chicago. We chose to live in St. Charles based on exceptional school ratings. That time they were all tens. We choose to live in this district and pay high taxes because our kids' education is very important to us. Now all schools in D303 declined drastically and have ratings of seven and eight. As a result, school enrollment is declining, families are leaving the district and many choose to be in private schools. If we were looking for a place to live now, we would not select St. Charles based on poor school performance. My high school, all grade eight students, tell me how they do not like the school anymore. They tell me how they're bored and hardly have any homework to do. The school is teaching them how to be lazy. My elementary school grade two student does not learn what my older kids learn in her grade level and her curriculum is almost a year behind. The school board and administration refuse to address academic decline. Dr. Pearson, who's been a superintendent since 2016, earning huge amount of taxpayers' money, succeeded in bringing our district performance down. This board has a responsibility for the community and our children to hold him and the administration responsible for the academic decline. Perhaps we need new leader and new administration. The administration keeps looking for an easy way out by hiring extremely divisive deep equity to address our poor performance issues. That way they can hide behind the critical race movement. The board and administration promised us an audit, yet it was never done. Politics have no room in our classrooms. Several districts across the country have been fighting this program that has been enforced on our children. This program brought nothing but division and grief among students, parents, teachers, and the board. Joe Blomquist, president of the St. Charles Education Association, stood here in this room and said on multiple occasions that the teachers community is overwhelmingly in support of this equity. We know now that as some teachers stated during multiple board meetings that they have never heard about this program and described how they have been attacked for difference of an opinion. Reverse the vote for deep equity. We need an audit. Please know we will not stop fighting for our kids. If you go forward with this divisive racist program, you will get a constant, never ending fight from the community. Thank you. Thank you. Marciella Scheller. Marciella Scheller. Good evening, board members. My name is Marcella Scheeler, and my pronouns are she, her, as an instructional support coach in D303. I have a number of roles in working with both staff and students, but one facet of my work is in looking at data to determine what our needs are as we design and facilitate professional learning. Anyone who clicks on the Illinois State Report Code can see data showing that comparatively, we are a high-performing district overall, and they can also see that our students who are non-white and low income are not achieving at the, nearly the same level as our students who are white. The truth is that we don't know specifically why our data looks like this, but we do know that we are not okay with it. We want to be champions for all of our students, and we want professional learning and tools to set us up for success. I have always taken pride in the fact that we are a district committed to making evidence-based decisions with regard to professional learning goals. We are asking that you experience and explore deep equity as a tool for professional learning with the goal of reducing this achievement gap. If after engaging in the professional learning yourselves, you determine it is not the best resource for us, then we are asking that we identify another resource that will achieve what we need. Getting professional learning to help us help our students is not a political decision, it is a reasonable decision. 
I'd like to read a short excerpt from a staff member's letter who described an incident in which her student used the N-word on social media and was emotionally distraught when it went viral and got her a tremendous amount of negative attention. When the incident occurred, my colleague stated, I had already taught about slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation as it was in the curriculum. Why didn't my student understand the hurtful nature of the N-word? Maybe it's because I didn't have the tools to teach that. And maybe, just maybe, I need them. Allow me to be the best teacher I can be. Thank you. Anthony Catella. Anthony Catella. Anthony Catella. Thank you very much, fellow citizens. My name is Anthony Catella. I'm one of the veterans amongst us to provide a constitutional framework to this whole scenario, this whole issue that we face. As a veteran, as a soldier, every soldier, sailor, marine, and airman, service member takes an oath to the Constitution of the United States. You know, it was 155 years ago yesterday, when in June, on June 13th, 1866, the, the 14th Amendment was proposed. And Omer, almost two years later, and by the way, if you ever heard of the wonderful celebration of Juneteenth by our fellow African American, by our fellow Americans of African descent, that was their celebration as newly freed slaves, knowing that they would become citizens of this great country. And Juneteenth was their celebration of the proposal of the, of the 14th Amendment. It was finally passed almost two years later. And it guarantees that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. And no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. My fellow countrymen, 58 years ago, this is the Constitution of the United States. Teach the Constitution of the United States in your schools. I got an A in my eighth grade Constitution test. And I will lastly conclude, 58 years ago, when facing a civil rights crisis in this country, an American president said this nation was founded by men of many nations and backgrounds. It was founded on the principle that all men are created equal and that the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. And as one of my fellow veterans said, you don't distinguish between color when you're in a foxhole. And President Kennedy said later in that speech, he said, when Americans are sent to Vietnam or West Berlin, we do not ask for whites only. My fellow countrymen, it is America's historic task and mission to be engaged in the noble struggle to promote and defend the equal human and civil rights of all of our fellow Americans. Thank you very much. Grant Rector. I'm Brant Rector. Uh, I didn't write a paper, but uh, you know, I came here because CRT. CRT is critical race theory. What it, what it we bundled now as it's a uh, cultural responsive training and you can bet they're going to rebundle it as something else so we're playing whack-a-mole here and we got to just be aware of that this isn't over and i think really what we got to look at is you know equality equality of opportunity that's what everybody wants right don't we want that that's where we should be focus not going to work on a quality of outcome now you know when you differentiate a class of people by their race uh shame them or underscore their indifferences or shortfalls it just sounds like racism to me um you know i was picked on in high school uh when i was a junior i was practically bald first one in my high school you know probably the only one and i was I was picked on. I didn't get a lot of opportunity. I wasn't picked for teams. Uh, it sucked, but you know, it didn't kill me and it did make me stronger. So let's just think about where we want to be. 
and trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, this whole racism thing really didn't exist a decade ago like we see it right now. This is a movement, you know, this is a Marxist movement that's coming into our country and they're hijacking this, you know. I am going to ask that you do not do that while someone is speaking. Then it's not. But I bet a lot of people think it is. So this isn't really an organic movement. You know, last summer started as a good, well-intentioned organic movement to demonstrate, but it turned out much different because it was hijacked by radicals. So, you know, let's see if we can just get together. Um, that's about it. You know, this is also based off the 1619 Project, the, the fictitious literature that was written for the New York Times. And that's an account of possibly what could have happened, but it's not fact. You know, we don't have primary sources now to draw from. But if you're going to use that as a basis, if they're going to use that as a basis of critical race theory, you know, it doesn't exist. My daughter went to East. Unfortunately, she was handicapped and she was ex excluded from a lot of things, you know, inclusive in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, in the lunchroom, library, no one wanted to sit down with her. No one, you know, she had that to deal with, you know, and the way it motivated her to graduate a half a semester early and get to college. Thank you, your time Thank is you. up. Okay, Catherine Caddyshook. After that, Lisa Caddyshook, if you could be waiting. Um, can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? Hi, okay, hello. My name is Catherine Caddyshook and I'm currently a sophomore at North. I have friends from a lot of different cultures and ethnicities, good friends. And when I befriended most of them several years ago, I did not consider their race or culture. I honestly barely even noticed it. I like them as people and I don't care what race they are. I'm sure they think the same way about me. Now I'm starting to hear about this program, Deep Equity, that's supposed to reduce inequality and racism in our schools. Okay, that sounds great. Personally, I don't encounter a lot of racism at school and I'm Jewish, that could be considered a minority group, but other people's experiences are of course different and I completely respect that. However, what you first hear about deep equity is just the surface, it's a pretty exterior. Equity is different from equality. I know someone's already said something about this, I'm gonna make it really short. Equality provides everyone with equal resources and opportunities while equity provides everyone with different resources and opportunities so that everyone may achieve the same outcome. I understand equity, I see it in our schools. When a student is behind, they get more time with the teacher than others to improve as much as everyone else. Deep equity takes this concept and instead of focusing on the struggling student, which would be those who encounter racism, they put a notch in everyone's education, making all of the students struggle, ending in the same equal outcome. I've seen some of the worksheets from this program online. Instead of trying to end the stereotypes about students of minority, they introduce and enforce all of the stereotypes about white people. These worksheets talk about what it means to be white and about how all whites are so racist and insensitive and terrible. I don't appreciate that. We're gonna pay thousands in our taxes for this program so that it can become part of our curriculum and take time out of the school day. Academics in this district are already declining. This previous year, my classes weren't very challenging. Most teachers said they had to cut stuff out that year because of COVID. The last thing we should be doing when our academics are in decline is taking more time out of the school day. Deep Equity says this decline is due to racism, but for me, like 99% of the students I see struggling are white, the majority. The worst thing about this whole Deep Equity program is that before I wouldn't think about someone's race, but now this program is saying racism is a big problem in my school and it's telling me what it means to be white, to be racist and insensitive. And now I kind of do think about it sometimes and I can't help but notice it and I really hate that. This program, even just from a few sheets that I saw, is really making me confused and it's upsetting. Do you wanna introduce this program to not just people my age, but impressionable small children? These sheets are telling me I'm not capable of properly interacting with people of different races. This program's supposed to teach me how to do that? Um, no, I value all of my friends and I know that isn't true. One of the worksheets discusses white culture and it talks about how men are dominant in society. That's an outdated viewpoint. 
Aren't we aiming for equality? Do you see what's being enforced here? This program will do serious damage to all of us. Okay, check your time is up. Um, you don't fight racism with more racism. Up next is Carrie Kay. Please be waiting. No, Lisa Kay, you should. Yeah, you're next, and then Mr. Kay. Hi, uh, my name is Lisa Kadishuk, and I'm a sophomore at North. <clears throat> Deep Equity is a program that should not be included in our curriculum. If this is implemented into our schools, the effects will be extremely damaging to the student population. Let me quickly explain the program and its goals. Deep Equity teaches that America is a deeply racist nation controlled by whites. Any whites disagreeing with this opinion are simply so immersed in their privileged status that they cannot realize that they are the oppressors. Furthermore, the deep equity process encourages that every minority must be treated individually because they are all different. Let's break this down. First, America is a racist nation controlled by white oppressors who always oppress minorities. This is a completely ignorant statement. This program is assuming that all white people have always and will always oppress people of any other ethnicity than their own. This generalizes a whole ethnic group of people and embodies racism and stereotyping. Throughout all of history, people of various ethnic backgrounds have fought for their rights and beliefs and the rights of other minority groups. For example, during the civil rights movement, white people fought alongside African-Americans for civil rights. This is only one example out of many. The actions of some people in an ethnic group do not define anyone else of that nationality. As decent human beings, we strive not to generalize or stereotype stereotype and base someone's opinion of another person based on their race or the other people belonging to that ethnic group. Instead, I've come to find that my own school is implementing a program that is calling me an oppressor who hates all non-whites. This is completely incorrect. This is racism. White people have been oppressed countless times throughout history, but this is not something focused on a lot in school. A famous example includes the Barbary slave trade, where millions of white Europeans were enslaved, bought, and sold by pirates in the Mediterranean and North Africa. This does not discount the drastic effects of the Atlantic slave trade or any other terrible genocides that occurred to any ethnic groups. People all over the, all over the world have been oppressed, and it is unjust to solely blame one group of people for this. Next, Deep Equity teaches that ethnic groups should be treated individually because they are all different. Simply put, this separates us into our groups instead of being united as Americans. This program will make students think about their differences more than ever before. We will think about our skin color as a divider between us. We are striving for equality, not separation. I've had friends of diverse ethnicity since I was a small child, but this has not changed the way I treat them or the way we can have fun spending time together. We acknowledge our differences and enjoy having cultural moments that are different from our own. Deep equity will change all of that and will make us see our differences as a barrier between us. This is unjust and will create many issues throughout the diverse student population. This is unacceptable. Do not implement the deep equity program. Thank you. Mary Kay. I am going to have you start lining up so that you are ready so it's not taking as long to bring speakers to the microphone. Uh, Ryan C will be next. Ryan C. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll be short. Um, I read the syllabus for deep equity, and simply put, it's uh, white supremacy with the uh, polls reversed. So it's still white supremacy, and uh, it does, has no place in our schools. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan C. Next up, Allison J. After Ryan C. Thank you all for your service. My name is Ryan Conboy, a parent and teacher of B303 students. To help more children prepare for this challenging life, our schools must fight inertia and pursue greater equity. This can and has been done already to some extent by some teachers and even by some PLCs. But to maximize student benefit, it needs to be done on a larger scale and most carefully, which means it must be done systematically. I had more to say about that, but I will defer to the comments of my previous colleagues. The past year powerfully reminds us that we are not insulated from others' problems. As Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, 
we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Now, some against this equity initiative have shown fear, a fear that gains made by others' children due to greater equity will come at a cost to their own children, perhaps in the form of school-imposed guilt about their relatively good fortune, or in the form of a curriculum that's somehow academically diluted, or in the form of a relatively less academic achievement or recognition for their already prepared children. This logic is tempting, but it is false. Education is not a zero sum game. Improvements in equity will significantly improve academic engagement and achievement for disadvantaged students, which is morally imperative. But equity gains will also inevitably improve the learning environment and the eventual working environment for those who are already successful. Over 20 plus years, I have seen other teacher training initiatives achieve these sorts of benefits without the costs that were feared by their previous naysayers. For example, longstanding initiatives have helped those at risk of self-harm or suicide in other marginalized groups without compromising academic quality. What helps one directly can help all indirectly. I'm excited to learn how to better serve all of my students. I support the board's pursuit of greater equity, hope that it exceeds, exceeds the state's minimum mandate and urge it to steadfastly resist the clamor and red herrings used by some of its opponents. Thank you. Thank you. Allison Day, Dr. Allison Day, Mary O. Good evening, board. Thank you for staying attentive for so long. My name is Allison Johnson. Most of you have met me and my son, Andrew, during my tenure on the Citizens Advisory Council as well as volunteering for Parent University. I come here today to challenge you to see this program from my perspective and the perspective of my son's aunt. The perspective that this program inherently institutionalizes teachers to believe that his parents are racist against him. It's also going to teach my son and my daughter by the most influential people in their lives between the ages of five and 18. There's nobody more influential to our children than their teachers. And to take a program like this in a time, look at this room, look at how divided we are. We're living in an apartheid and this program is going to promote that. And it has been proven to in other districts that have adopted it. And I challenge you, if you don't choose today, to roll this back, pump the brakes, give it some time, give everybody a little bit of time to really think this through, do some more research, let other districts adopt it first. Don't let our kids, my son and daughter, be the ones to test these new programs on. Thank you. Mary O. Mary O. Just because I don't want to tell them to fix me. Okay, Mickey P. Good evening. Um, I have a response to the resistance to this training. It's clearly misunderstood. Um, the question is, what are you afraid of? 
understanding each other, appreciating other cultures, having compassion. Diversity includes the variety of people to include many of our students, not just race, but handicapped, children that don't fit the norm. Our country is multiracial as well as socially and culturally diverse. Being respectful is what this training is about. This directly relates to bullying. We know we have a problem with bullying. It directly relates to bullying. <sighs> directly relates to the mental health of our students. Somebody talked about mental health. It directly relates to mental health. Have you been paying attention to the news? With recent events of racism in this country, it's apparent that we need to educate the youngest citizens and be sure our teachers are trained and prepared to face classroom conflict and unfairness. Teachers need to model these qualities while they teach. And I will ask you again, what are you afraid of? Thank you. Jack Ryder, and then Janelle Pickett. Hi, glad to be here. I had, uh, my name is Jack Rigard. I had three children that went through this school district. We're all called to be critical of things, actions, but not persons. Cannot cut down people in the name of equity or equality. We could, we could and should only build them up. That's the one thing that should be our guide. Critical race theory holds that the most important thing about you is your race, the color of your skin. That's who you are not your behavior, not your values, not your environment, but your race. Critical race theory begins with the assumption that racism occurs in all interactions. To see how it works, consider the thought experiment. Imagine you own a shop and two customers enter at the same time, one white, one black. Who do you help first? If you help the black person, critical race would say that you did so because you don't trust black people to be left alone in your store. That's racist. If you help the white person first, critical race theory would say you did so because you think blacks are second class citizens. That's racist too. That's critical race theory. You can find racism in anything, even if it has to be, even if it has to read your mind to do it. Of my four grandparents, they all came from different countries. Three of them came to the United States as orphans. My grandmother Agnes fleeing the Nazis and the communists that invaded her native Poland and enslaved all of them. She came here after both parents had died with a third grade education. My get grandmother Catherine was adopted as a farm hand at four years old, enslaved for all practical purposes to hard labor, stripped of all their clothes as a little girl, first forced to climb up on a naked, uh, naked on a table as she watched the old man that she would call him ceremoniously get a switch from a tree in plain sight and beat her. Jackie, she said to me, the hardest thing is that I never knew what I was being beaten for. You see, that's critical race theory. It can always be hatred, always conflict, always division, and we will never know what the beating's for. It's always a power trip. You can control people as to keep them in disarray, setting up perpetual, perpetual conflicts of hatred, insecurities, people ratting out others, the communists do it today, keeping the rules vague so we'll, they'll always can be distorted and keep people in fear. It does this because critical race theory proponents assume racism is, is present everywhere and always, and they look for it critically until they find it. And they always find it. It's there because that's how America was set up, they say. Yet I assure you, my grandparents, none of them, and all of them were the kindest, loving people you would ever meet and never had a racial tone or bone in their bodies. The world cries out for justice, and it should. Racism is a sin, and yet, it would be difficult not to notice that the very programs would start from the idea of justice and which ought to assist its fulfillment among individuals, groups, and human societies and practice suffer from distortion. Although they continue to appeal the, the idea of justice, experience shows that other negative forces have gained Mr. the upper Ryan, hand. Your time is up, thank you. Thank you. Can I please have Janelle Pickett, then Kelly Rotella, then Elena Gadula. Good evening. My name is um, Janelle Pickett. I'm the proud mom of Olivia Fultz Courtney, class of 2023, who is half Mexican and half white. And I am the aunt 
to TJ Pinex, class of 2022, who is black. I'm here to support the training, be it deep equity or whoever you guys choose. <clears throat> I would like to remind everyone of D303 school board commitments. For one, provide learning opportunities responsive to the whole student, which will prepare them for life after District 303. Two, allocate community resources responsibly to ensure exemplary student growth. Three, monitor and continue to improve our safe and secure learning environments for our students and staff. Four, promote our environment of respect, responsibility, and good citizenship. Five, support and sustain a culture of learning and leadership that attracts, develops, and retains high quality staff. Finally, number six, engage and collaborate with stakeholders to develop trusting partnerships for the betterment of our students. I realize as board members, you should want all students to have access to resources to achieve their highest poten potential academically. And I stress that word academically. I too want that. However, you are analyzing test scores, grades, graduation rates, et cetera, to determine if DO3 is academically equitable. Textbooks, review sessions for upcoming tests, scholarships and award applications, and extracurricular activities are not the only variables that are impacting our students. The unobtainable data is what is concerning. Both of my kids have come home with scenarios of feeling uncomfortable within the confines of D303 for various reasons. If you would like specifics, I will gladly share them with you in a private conversation. As you are aware, I'm the minority in my household. Every day, I live the phrase, you don't know what you don't know. It is my hope you too will realize you don't know what you don't know. I hope you embrace some type of training and a bridge between deep equity. Thank you for your time. After Ms. Rotella is Elena Badula. Please line up. Hi, I'm Kelly Rotella, and I am here for two statements. On behalf of the DPTO, thank you, Dr. Chapman, for all of your service. Uh, secondly, I am here with as to speak for the League of Women Voters of Central Kane County, and I am a mother of three students in D303. Diversity includes all of the similarities and differences among people not limited to gender, gender identity, ethnicity, race, native or indigenous origin, age, generation, sexual orientation, culture, religion, belief system, marital status, parental status, socioeconomic, socioeconomic status, appearance, language, accent, ability status, mental health, education, geography, nationality, work style, work experience, job role function, thinking style, personality type, physical appearance and political perspective or affiliation. Diversity refers to population groups that have been historically underrepresented, upper, underrepresented in socially, politically, or economically powerful institutions and organizations. These, group, these groups include, but are not restricted to populations of color, such as African-Americans and Blacks, Latinx, Native Americans and Alaska Natives, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. They may also include lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender populations, people with disabilities, women, and other groups. Equity is an approach based in fairness to ensuring that everyone is given equal opportunity. This means that resources may be divided and shared unequally to make sure that each person has a fair chance to succeed. Equity takes into account that people have different accesses to recess or resources because of systems of oppression and privilege. 
equity seeks to balance that disparity. Improving the equity in involves increasing justice and fairness within the procedures and processes of institutions or systems, as well as in their distribution of resources, including professional growth opportunities. Tackling equity requires an understanding of the root causes of outcomes disparities within our society. Inclusion is an ongoing process, not a static state of being. Inclusion is the dynamic state of operating in which diversity is leveraged to create a healthy, high-performing organization and community. Inclusion refers to the degree which, to which diverse individuals are able to participate fully in the decision-making process within an organization or group. An inclusive envi environment ensures equitable access to resources and opportunities for all. It also enables in individuals and groups to feel safe, respected, engaged, motivated, and valued for who they are and for their contributions toward organizational and societal goals. While an inclusive group is by definition diverse, a diverse group is not always inclusive. Being aware of unconscious or implicit bias can help organizations better address issues of inclusivity. Thank you. Thank you. Ava Johnson, please line up. Hello, my name is Elena Gudula. I use your pronouns and I'm an alumni from St. Charles East High School and a former GSA president. And I've been in this district for over 11 years. You may remember me from the March school board meeting. I recently graduated, yet I am still here to fight for change and to support my peers and former classmates who still reside in this district, as these schools mean so much to me. I still support District 303's partnership with Deep Equity, and I sincerely believe that all students, no matter their gender, skin color, orientation, background, or religion, should have equity in their should have equity in their access to education throughout this district, and I ask you to please vote to keep this program in our schools. After the successful vote a few months back, my peers and I were extremely grateful for the board's vote to move forward with Deep Equity, and we're excited to see positive change going forward. But after protests from adults, our step towards increased success among populations that see inequity and disadvantages in parts of their education is now in danger. If you voted yes on Deep Equity back in March, you have our heartfelt thanks, and we hope you continue to stand with our students. If you voted no or have recently been inducted into the board, I, we use students strongly and respectfully urge you to reconsider. I have heard and I understand the concerns for Deep Equity as it is a fairly new organization, but I failed to see how it could negatively, negatively impact students in any way. During my last couple months at East, I have heard from staff members and administrators expressing satisfaction with how their training with Deep Equity had been going so far. Many students and teachers had also personally come up to me and other students who had fought for this, gracious for the work we have done to get this program enacted in our schools. But now that Deep Equity may be withdrawn, even after positive progress has already been made in our district, we are back to voice our support for it as we are fearful that its withdrawal may cause more regression. For example, in our current climate in America, I am sad to see many states taking steps backwards in terms of basic human rights, especially when it comes to equitable access and its education for students. Every day I see news stories of adults who go out of their way to harm others who are different from them, such as racist attacks or homophobic comments towards groups and minorities. And it pains me to continue to hear these comments like those around me. And I think to myself that if these people had learned about the histories of diff people different from them in their education, such as through a, a curriculum that deep equity could provide, would they have reacted differently in a non-hateful way? So instead of following the decline in other districts around the United States, I implore you to please listen to the concerns of students themselves and continue with deep equity, as we will continue to fight for a more diverse and inclusive environment for all students that fosters better mental health, access to resources and knowledge of diverse topics that they will for sure encounter throughout their lives. Finally, as many of us have said before, progress towards equity in D303 schools, such as by staying with deep equity, deep equity, will help ensure that more students will succeed in their academics, regardless of their race, sexuality, gender, religion, and more, and will help open up the minds of students to many diverse backgrounds that will prevent the spread of hate and academic inequity in our schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Marla Kadula, please line up. Hi, I'm Ava Johnson, and I was going to read Clara's letter that she wrote, but since she's here, she'll take the floor. Hello, I'm Clara Noah. Hello, I'm Clara Noah, and I will be going to St. Charles East. School environments can feel unwelcoming to many students and deep equity is the way to help everyone feel safe, happy, and comfortable at school. Kids are bullied, called slurs, made fun of, and rejected from classroom groups in a space where they are supposed to feel free to be themselves. 
Good mental health is essential to effective learning. And if no one, if no changes are made, these kids will be forced to feel shut off from being their true selves. Deep equity isn't designed to isolate students who don't need help, but rather to lift up everyone together. This does not mean targeting any groups of people in any way. This just means that the students who are struggling academically, socially, or emotionally get the help they need to reach the standards just like everyone else. Forming strong connections in the classroom has been harder than ever because of the pandemic. And if students knew that their teachers were properly trained to be equitable, that can make a world's difference. There have been countless numbers of time I wish a student, teacher, or staff member stood up for me in my personal social experience. Multiple times, multiple students and a teacher knew how I was being treated by another student, being called names, being isolated, and being left out for simply chatting with a group of other classmates. The group of students only watched and did not stand up for me, and the teacher only helped when I stood up for myself instead of staying quiet and letting the students' words destroy me. Then, the teacher isolated me rather than addressing the other student. This is just one example of many that students go through at school. So instead of allowing this to continue, let's decrease the chances of things like this happening. We ask you to keep deep equity, to pursue equality, make everyone feel comfortable, happy, safe, and to show students that they are not alone and they can get help. We ask you to not take this program away so that teachers can focus on bettering equity in students. So students can go forward knowing that they can succeed no matter their ethnicity, amount of money, gender identity, mental disorders, religion, or any other category. Although not every single student goes through the tough situations like this, many students do. So let's be mindful of students who have it harder and make the schools in D3 safe, enjoyable, wonderful places that they can thrive in because right now the schools aren't that. Okay, Violet. Violet Kedura. Queen Bartlett, please line up. Good evening, everyone. As a mom to a recent high school graduate, a teacher for 27 plus years, and coming to America as a child from another country speaking very little English, I have experienced that we are all unique individuals who need different support at school, work, and in life in order to be successful. I was fortunate enough to have two parents who emigrated to the United States when my brother and I were little. They wanted the best education for us and to chase that American dream. My mother was a nurse and supervisor in South America, and my father from Europe was an engineer. Although my father spoke seven languages, English was difficult for him when he arrived here in his 50s. My mother, on the other hand, speaking Spanish and French, managed to learn English to get her nursing license in Illinois. I saw firsthand the struggles to learn English and how it affected my parents. My brother and I had to learn English fast in order to help our parents back in the day. <coughs> Excuse me. I've seen it over the years as well with my students in low income areas and Native American English language learners who have to figure out the American slang, literary devices, regional dialects, and culture shocks. I am currently a high school teacher who works in the bilingual special education department. I often see Native Spanish speaking students who struggle with their classes due to the curriculum's poor integration of materials for non English speakers. I would be extremely grateful to have had something like deep equity implemented in my district and to see it in danger of being taken away in another school district when it has already begun to help is very disappointing. I have also been a proctor for standardized tests administers, administered from early childhood through high school. And I can assure you that even I could not believe that all of our students are expected to take them. There's nothing wrong with our kids Rather, there's something wrong with these tests and curriculum students have to follow. We have to recognize that we do not all start from the same place. I support deep, deep equity in D303, and I strongly encourage the board to keep it implemented in the school district. Last but not least, uh, and 
excerpt from Green Life. We are not here to tolerate our differences. We are here to accept them. We are not here to celebrate our sameness. We are here to salute our distinctions. We are not born into equal circumstances or with equal abilities, but we should have equal opportunity. As individuals, we unite in our values. Celebrate that. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Butel. Judy Butel. Okay, we'll move to Carl King and then Jeff Galush, if you could please line up. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl King, and along with my wife, we parent three children currently in the B303 system. Um, I'd been buying my wife a bunch of presents, and uh, she said the next one she was going to burn, so I bought her a candle. Um, tough crowd. <laughs> um, so our family has watched with growing interest the evolution of this conversation on equity uh, with three children in this public school system. Uh, we've experienced firsthand the racism of students and sometimes the fumbling attempts of district staff, teachers, and administrators to address pointed discrimination. Uh, some gathered here would prefer our children to bear the burden of racist actions instead of equipping teachers with the tools to lead the student population so as to avert traumatic incidents. One of the resounding themes that uh, resurfaces anytime there's a conversation around trans transformation, it boils down to the point that's been uh, made ad nauseum today. We don't oppose the objectives of equity. Uh, we just are concerned with how it's being implemented. Uh, the often recounted uh, cliche states where there's a will, there's a way. And I say equally to the school board as well as to those who oppose equity on the basis of some nebulous uh, procedural objection. If you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to make it happen. That has been spoken often tonight. I understand how important it is for the teachers to understand their audience, to emphasize or empathize with them and have their lived experiences front of mind. The school board vo voted and approved this equity work for the sake of our children, our teachers, and our administrators. Uh, some have spoken about our founding documents, but didn't quite mention the three-fifths compromise in the Article I of the Constitution that made the 14th Amendment necessary, or Jim Crow, the Red Summer, mass lynchings, uh, and all of the oppression that made the civil rights struggle necessary, right? We, we make steps forward, we have steps back. And so we have to be trained repeatedly. And this is a continual process. The district, um, let me say this, equity is about teaching all of the history, not cherry picking it. This di district has the opportunity to teach and address foundational principles head on and not dodge them using a canard or a straw man. As Dr. King said, he's having quite a night tonight. Uh, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that our great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens council or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice who prefers a negative piece, which is the absence of tension, to a positive piece, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods. If we believe in equity, major ellipsis, exaggerated comma, but the onus is on us to refuse Mr. to hide King, behind time is up. a dodge Thank and go you. forward. Thank you. Claire Severson, please line up. Hello, uh, my name is Jeffrey Gallows, and uh, my son was a student here at Haynes, and he was uh, hard of hearing, right? And none of his teachers were hard of hearing. None of the consuls were hard of hearing. Yet the empathy and the care was shown to him was amazing. And every two or three months, my wife and I would come in for a meeting with them, and we were overwhelmed. And I, every time I said, you know, I couldn't believe the individual care that the teachers and uh, the counselors showed for my son to help him grow. 
And so I, so I firmly believe that this CRT and uh, deep equity is going to not, you know, I know these arguments, most of the arguments tonight have been about emotion. On, oh, I, you know, we all want love, right? We all do. But these, uh, these programs would not bring students together, but tear them apart. They will not create a better environment for students, but a more divisive environment. They will not build students up, but tear students down. They will not promote justice, but injustice. They will not promote love, but division. Thank you. Thank you. Is Claire Severson here? No, okay. Claire? Uh, Mary Strauss, please line up. Good evening. I'm Claire Severson. I'm a St. Charles resident. I have taught high school special education for 34 years, the last 17 years in Naperville. And what I want to tell you tonight is a little glimpse into my experience with critical race theory in Naperville. I had always been proud to teach in District 203. That is until a recent Institute Day where our keynote speaker insisted that systemic racism runs rampant in Naperville, including in our schools. I listened as she explained about the need to make public apologies for privilege, that all teachers have subconscious biases against people of color, and that social emotional learning risks becoming white supremacy with a hug. Pushback from those with opposing viewpoints was met with the term white rage by our keynote speaker. I couldn't believe my ears. Last summer, I witnessed a group of teens marching through the streets of Naperville following a man with a bullhorn and repeating, white people suck. I don't think this is what we want to teach our kids. I don't think this is the message we want to send to our young people. I think it's racist. I believe that this focus on systemic racism and white supremacy does nothing but divide. It does not unite. As a devout Catholic, I believe that God created all men equal and in his likeness, regardless of color, race, or creed. As a proud American, I don't believe that the majority of our country is racist. There are racists in all walk of life, yes, and this needs to be addressed but they are a minority, an ugly minority. There are others here today who are too afraid to speak up for fear of being labeled, canceled, or worse. CRT is often dressed up as equity training, but we know what it is. It's hateful, divisive. It labels people by the color of their skin. It teaches children to hate their country, to feel oppressed, or guilty for the sins of those no longer living. Our family moved to this district for the quality education, not for the political agenda. These are just a few things to think about moving forward. Thank you for allowing me to speak for those who can't or those who won't. Please vote no on CRT. Can I have Lisa, Lisa Raphael, please line up? Hi, I'm Mary Strauss, and I've been a D303 parent for 17 years. In my very humble opinion, whether or not you agree with the deep equity program isn't the real issue, at least not for me. I am concerned with how this particular issue was handled, and it makes me wonder how other decisions are being made, not just on this program, but all programs. Number one. There was supposed to be an audit completed by March, 2021. That audit was not done. At the last board meeting, this is number two, multiple board members noted that they didn't have a plan or a strategy mapped out for this program. And if there was one, it wasn't discussed and people didn't speak up about it. Number three, after attending the last board meeting, it was apparent to me that many board members didn't seem to know what the program was all about. And if they did, they didn't speak up. Number four, 
This was communicated poorly to D303 teachers, parents, and taxpayers. I don't think there is anyone here who doesn't want what is best for every single D303 student. I want every student to have the same opportunities, no matter what race, gender, socioeconomic status, religion, et cetera. However, when making decisions as big as this, one that is so politically charged, and you can see that in this room, and I purposely did not wear a red shirt or a green shirt, because to me, this is about the process that you guys took to make a decision that affects everybody. The school board needs to be transparent and follow the protocol that you agreed to, an audit by March, 2021. That is a fact that can't be disputed. Decisions such as these should not be made in a vacuum. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have Ron Waddell line up, please? Hi, I'm Lisa Raphael. I have two kids coming into D303. Um, everything that I was going to say are null and void now. I wanted to say, look at how this is dividing us, as you can see. Um, to half this room, I'm a resistor. To half this room, I'm afraid of learning about other cultures. And to half this room, I'm assuming they look at me as a racist. I said I'm assuming what the other half of the room thinks because that is what deep equity does. It assumes white people are inadvertently racist. Gary Howard, the founder of deep equity, even said so. Clearly, many people here on both sides did not take the actual time to look into this program or Gary Howard, the founder of the program, or looked up his keynote speeches, one entitled, How to Raise Good White Folk. Many districts across the country have implemented this program and have recalled it already. You can look on YouTube and watch other school board meetings where they read text from the actual deep equity books. What these speakers are asking for and what deep equity actually is are not the same. Uh, some things from the workbooks that we have saw was uh, page 257, look for signs of resistance and ignore behavior for a while. Confront those with negative behavior. Um, another one, 261, discuss videos that they want the teachers and staff to watch. Social dominance, privilege and power, school discussions, white identity orientation, race and whiteness conversation, mirrors of privilege discussion, these are not things that are going to unite us. These are things that are gonna make the white teachers have to admit whether they are or not racist. But look around, look at you. There's not one person of color up here. Dr. Pearson, I mean, you could step down and you could give someone else your seat. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna talk about equity, then, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as I was saying, if you want to talk about equity, then open up your seats. I'm sure there's someone in the audience that would want to take your, your seat. So you're, you're preaching to the choir here that, that the, the school is racist, but yet we got a bunch of white people. So in my in other opinion, basically, is that we have, we already have a grievance policy. So with all these people that have had these injustices to them, where, where is that? Where is the, what, who is it? Mike Moore or um, Jan, whatever, were the grievances dealt with? How are they going to be dealt with going forward? So you're just going to have this training and then every, everything's going to be like rainbows and unicorns. No, that's not, you, you need to hold accountability. Where's the other half of it? Where are you going to hold teachers that are still acting like this or, or uh, students that are still acting like this? The, pro the other problem is, is that the school board of education protects these teachers. So all these teachers, all these students that had these grievances, were the, were the teachers dealt with? Were the students dealt with? Where's the other half of the accountability? And it's on our, on our dime, basically. I would like my dime to be spent on other resources for my kid who can't read. Thank you. Can I have Andy Belafast line up, please? Yeah, I am Ron Waddell. I've uh, communicated with some of the board members here, and uh, I uh, want to point out that uh, the whole reason we're here is because the district has identified four subgroups of students who are disadvantaged because their their scores in math, reading, science have been dropping. There's a, a widening disparity gap in their performance, and those students are minority students, IEP students, ESL students, and economically disadvantaged students. So what? 
Do you even have the data to know at this point, what is the reason why those four subgroups of people are not thriving, why they're not succeeding? If we're gonna implement this process, the deep equity process, it should be targeted towards improving those educational goals of those students. We have a lot of information here before us. I have submitted a letter to the King County Chronicle that'll be published on Thursday. And I wanna let you know that I think we have a great community here. We have a community that is very progressive in terms of our openness and our encouragement of, you know, of one another to improve. I will let you know the critical race theory was addressed in the education week by Stephen Sawchuk, May 18th of this year. And he identifies that essentially the article is, what is critical race theory and why is it under attack? Critical race, race theory postulates on the basis of whites, people have exercised privilege and power to oppress non-white people who are victims of white privilege. I went to social work school at Jane Addams College of Social Work back in the 1980s. I'm in a time portal. This was the same issue we were dealing with back then, unity and diversity, racism. I mean, remember the great days of the Great Society Program, the Monaghan Report, Dr. Julius Wilson from University of Chicago, Stokely Carmichael, institutional racism. Yes, this country has had racism and it has been institutionalized. We've seen some terrible outcomes. However, this is a 40 year old academic and now it's obviously in the public domain issue. I think that we have to look at how are we going to be able to best improve the educational goals and outcomes of our students, those four subgroups, that's why we're here today. And I think that uh, we need to come to a, a realization that we can do this. Many years ago, and I'm saying as a, I'm speaking as a public citizen, public person right now, but I'm involved in the city of St. Charles Mental Health Board we funded the program that's called Teachers Encourage Kids many years ago. If some may remember um, Dr. Kim Perkins and uh, Ron Freed, they were the educationers, the, the principal, assistant principal at Haynes um, Middle School. They pre presented at the National School Board Administrator Conference, the tech program, which was intended to reduce suspensions of students, at-risk students and students who were not thriving. And it was a very successful program. At one point, the, the, the tech program went to both uh, both high schools and also all three middle schools. And it, it was statistically important because the teachers were actually encouraging the, the kids and it was data driven and Mr. it was a Weber. successful program. So okay, think about Thank that. You. We have Andy Belafast here. Andy. Oh, you're on here twice. Look at that. Uh, can I have David? I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I'm reading here, but is there a David, last name starts with a D? Yep, great. Can I have Michael, Sarah, Sarah, you know, line up? Well, uh, thank you all for being here, your patience, your service, appreciate it. Thank you for the open-minded people in the crowd who, who are open to things. I, I've been at a lot of meetings, I'm on a lot of boards, and it really is hard to get things disrupted uh, when you're public servants and we're just trying to talk things out. So I'm a healthcare uh, worker, clinical healthcare worker. I've attended uh, weekly of some sort or another uh, trainings, professional development. As a clinical healthcare worker, things change a lot. Um, to me, this is about professional development. Uh, I've heard a lot of the teachers speak eloquently about wanting to have some professional development. You guys have studied this uh, a great deal. I'm at healthcare. If I were on a board in healthcare, I'd like to listen, but I wouldn't like to be told again and again about my bad faith and my, please people listen, okay? So, you know, I took a lot of training and I rolled my eyes a lot, and especially when I was first starting, and I thought some things were really dumb. Some of the things I thought were the dumbest were the things that worked best with patients. And I, I learned to listen in trainings more, and I learned to take something out of the training, even if, I, even if I wasn't ideologically aligned with the training, okay? This is professional development. Please let our teachers get their professional development. 
uh, but the bigger reason I'm here is I'm here on behalf of someone else, a family. I have two kids in the thing. I have multiracial, blah, 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 nephews, nieces, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we all told the story. But I also have people in my family who will not let people of a certain race into their homes. Okay, so I'm so glad to hear there's no racism in America. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. So, you know, in this community, I have friends who are diverse and they've told me they're thinking about leaving the community. And they're very hurt, deeply hurt by this tone. This tone that to me is anti-American. We're Americans. Don't, don't laugh at each other. I, I, if I'd known about the dress code, I would have worn a red top and green bottom, okay? So anyway, but I do have some specific things. That hurts me too. We hear about that for other St. Charles residents. That hurts me. It doesn't hurt me personally. I, I can live here. But for Mr. McNally, I have a final concern only after hearing your radio appearance on 52721 on a Chicago radio station. Millions of people could have been listening to that. I don't know that everyone here is from the community because of your appearance on a radio station. On that appearance, you said, I'm one of seven. I'm one against seven. I'm, I'm the only conservative. And then you said, uh, it took some time to get this thing rebooted. But we're going to fight it. And I'm going to ask people to show up Sir. in force. To show up in force. Sir, thank you. Michael Saravac, is it Saravaco or Saravino? No, okay. Uh, Diana Solstice. And then can I have uh, Sarita Johnson line up? Good evening, my name is Diana Soltis. I have two children in D303, my youngest of which has just graduated and I thank God for that. Um, this issue has brought me out to my first board meeting and my first time writing the board because I think it's very crucial. I think that while things may be needed in the schools, this particular program is not. I've been on many boards. I work for local government, so I understand how it works. You have the ability to rescind this contract or alter this contract in order to not have it be racially motivated or cause disparity or distance between each other. Equity and equality are not the same. I equate equity with socialism and equality with Americanism. And I had two students, as I had said, in this program, and my oldest endured such bullying in middle school that he would wake up every single day and say, time to go to hell. And I explained to him that sometimes you have to go to hell before you can go to heaven. And that he needs to find it within himself to deal with this if it's not gonna be dealt with at the school. I didn't expect the school to deal with it. In fact, I expect the school to teach people to be critical thinkers. And as a critical thinker, I went to my administrator friend in Batavia who said, this doesn't work. I went to my teacher friend in Naperville who said, this doesn't work. I went to my many, many multiracial friends, one of which happens to be African-American and went to DeSable High School. And I said, what does it take to help minority students be successful? And she said, it's how you're raised, it's your parents. You need to come from a solid foundation. Teachers are important, but that background, I thought that was interesting because it was my belief. I went to my Ukrainian friend, I went to my Asian friend, I went to my Hispanic friend and so forth. Asked the same question, got the same answer. It was parenting, faith. Teachers were in the lineup, but way down the line. Teachers do need to be more sensitive, but they can't be all things to all students. You have to raise them up in a way where they are kind and respectful to everyone. And well, like I said, there may be things that are needed. This particular program is not. What distresses me is that many citizens didn't know about this. I just found out about this. As I had said, I had no intention of speaking tonight, um, but I think it's an irresponsible use of power to implement this contract 
without it having been fully vetted to the community and have people's feedback, because I do believe that we're seeking something similar here in that we want the best opportunities for our children we can possibly get or we wouldn't have moved here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarita Johnson. Okay. So we have some speakers who are in outside or in another room. So um, we may need to be patient for a moment. Check. You ready for Ms. Johnson or Doc? Yes. Can I like? Okay. Hi, I'm Haley Shea, and I just finished my sophomore year at East. Um, being my fifth year in the district. I'm here tonight because I have some concerns about the teachers, leaders, and curriculum of D3. Favoritism within the classroom against me because I have learning disabilities. I have a 504 and have had it throughout the past four years from a brain cancer called medulloblastoma. My mother and I kept telling the teachers what I needed and they refused. Now in 2021, two and a half years after I finished treatment, which took nearly two years, the assistant principals finally started to do what is required of them by law. By law. <laughs> on the curriculum, onto the curriculum. Teens are depressed, duh. Teen suicide rates have majorly increased in the last 10 years, in the last five years. And every single one of the books being read in English 10 has multiple deaths and many times suicides and suicidal people in them. Even if this doesn't cause suicidal thoughts in teens, it surely doesn't help with these thoughts. When I complained about this, they changed the books for me, but me alone. This is not enough. If these are the subjects that appear within depressed children's curriculum, the least that can be done is teaching kids other ways and continuously checking in on them. But no, instead, the schools say that depressed kids talk about their depression, which we all know is a lie. In CWI, they teach false things, such as there's only, only poverty in Africa and preparing us for zombie apoc apocalypse, which we all know is only something of sci-fi movies. Thank you to Mrs. Rybachuk and Mr. Chapman for being good teachers and helping me by truly caring. Thank you for your time here tonight and I hope that some changes will be made. Cyril Schwartz. We all have. Mrs. Johnson. Yeah. Oh, give Mrs. Johnson. Okay. Yeah, sorry, we just flip flopped. Okay. Hi there. Uh, my name is Sarita Johnson. I'd like to start for just a second and say a prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for hi, for being here in our school districts, for being with our children, protecting them. Lord, we lift up our school board to you, and we ask you to help them make decisions that will benefit our kids to protect them, to keep them safe. We thank you in Jesus name. I could, um, again, my name is Sarita Johnson. I could stand here and talk about our constant battles with my daughter's 504, 
or the curriculum being taught, especially in English and CWI, um, which we receive paper copies of everything. Um, but no, instead, I would like to bring, uh, I would like to ask two questions, and I'm really hoping that I can have the answers. Um, D303 hosted two days of a COVID shot clinic uh, just after the CDC had confirmed it would cause heart problems in kids. Um, I wrote this on the sidewalks in the parking lot of my daughter's school at St. Charles East. Um, I was greeted by the Dean of Students, the Vice Principal, uh, asking us to leave. Um, I asked them if they knew that the CDC had said this. Uh, they said they cared about their sidewalks. Speechless, I locked eyes with Eric Hoffer, the Dean of Students, and again asked him, um, you're telling me that you don't care if these kids end up with heart problems. Uh, not looking away, the Dean of Students said to me, nope. And then I turned and looked at uh, Lisa Dondre, the Vice Principal, and asked her, and you? And she replied, I care about my sidewalks. All while the Dean of Students was trying to stop my daughters from continuing to write by trying to step on their hands. So my first question is, did you know that the CDC said that, sh that the shot could cause heart problems in our kids? And uh, if you didn't know it, why didn't you know it? Because you're hosting it. My second question is, now that you know that the VP and the Dean of Students care more about their sidewalks than our kids, what are you gonna do about it? Uh, I plan on filing a police report. Uh, I was planning on doing it the following of this meeting. However, they only go until 10 o'clock, um, but I will be filing a police report. So if anybody ends up with uh, heart problems from this um, shot, uh, it will be on record that the Dean of Students and the VP were aware that this would cause this. And they said they cared more about their heart problems. And I would, um, or, right, about their sidewalks, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is very concerning to me. This is, these are the folks that our kids come to and ask for help. They look up to them. They respect their opinions. Us as parents come to them and they care more about their sidewalks. That's crazy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do I have Cyril Schwartz? Cyril Schwartz? No. Okay. Jen Christensen. And then can I have Erica Jackson line up? Good evening. Sorry. This thing to work, sorry. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? My name is Jen Christensen. I read that part of the reason for the deep equity program is lower test scores and more disciplinary action for non-white students. I am the mother of an eight-year-old boy in the D303 school district who struggles with reading. He entered first grade below grade level for reading. He was put into the D303 reading intervention, which was 15 minutes a day with four other children. It did nothing to improve his reading. There were not enough resources. My son struggled, and so he acted out in class. I watched as my son was immediately labeled as a problem to the point that when he was being bullied by older kids, the teachers did not help him. My husband and I chose to get him tutoring outside of the school, and we were fortunate enough to be able to afford outside tutoring for our son's reading problem. I'm sure I am not the first parent with a child with reading challenges. I was raised in the melting pot of New York City, and I support equality for all. I think our community would be better served by using the money we are spending on the deep equity contract to hire more reading specialists to help all children excel regardless of wealth, race, or religion. If a child gets set on the right educational path at a young age, I believe 
they have a better chance for success. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have Tony Davis line up? Hi, my name is Erica Jackson. I'm a parent of two students um, in St. Charles. My oldest is a third grader and my youngest will be a kindergartner next year. My daughters are students of color. My husband is black, I'm white, and I'm asking that you please vote to continue your contract with Deep Equity and continue to actively pursue equity training for teachers and staff. My daughters deal with racial experiences a lot, okay? I thought I would share a few educational examples. When my oldest was in first grade, she decided to wear her hair out natural, okay? And so she did, and she went to school, and another little boy in her class, in the actual class, said, what happened to your hair? Did you stick your finger in a light socket? So my daughter comes home from school. She refuses to wear her hair in any other style than tight buns, okay, for the rest of the school year, despite me encouraging her, trying to talk to her about it. It was hard, you know, to see that she didn't feel like she could be herself at her own school, okay? Then I have my youngest, she was in preschool. She had another child who was mixed in her class. And I thought, yes, this is good. I secretly was happy. She has another kid who kind of looks like her. Then I went to visit, um, like we get to do. And uh, I noticed when they would say, hey, you know, go help my child. Then the children would go to the other child who was mixed and vice versa. Basically, they treated the children like they're the same person. You know, that they were the same identity. They didn't have separate names. They were just the two mixed children. It was hard and the teachers didn't seem to notice. They didn't seem to redirect the behavior. So here as a mom, my heart sinks. As a white mom, I don't really deal with a lot of racial stress my entire life, right? And so sometimes I don't know how to have these conversations. What deep equity means to me is that I can have these conversations with my kids' teachers because I didn't. I didn't feel like I could. I didn't feel like those teachers would know how to have that conversation with me. I wasn't sure they were gonna think I'm overreacting, but the truth is I am scared to see what 12 more years of that looks like for my daughter. What happens to her, you know? What does she end up? Does she become more of herself or less of herself? That's what I'm asking. Please vote for it. Thank, Thank you. you. No, Tony Davis. Can I have Brian Doyle line up? Uh, let me raise this up. Accessibility. Uh, thank you all. Uh, you guys all have families and responsibilities at home. And this is all volunteer work. So much respect to you and everyone coming out tonight. Um, it just kind of shows all the passion that we have for our education system. Um, one big thing I, I want to get across here. My name is Tony Davis. I have three kids in the district uh, 303 system. Um, I, I'm, I'm really perplexed on ultimately what we're fighting over. Uh, I, I, I'm gathering that this is a school board that wants to implement a system that betters the teachers. Um, so are we struggling to express empathy towards each other? Um, do the arguments of this program mean we can't show that kind of empathy to each other? Uh, I, I wanted to believe it, uh, but prior, you know, prior to coming to this meeting today, um, but as we all sit here, and we're divisive in our colors like black, black socks and cubs, um, we're validating our need to understand each other a lot better. And I think this deep equity program is, is justifying that. Um, in this rather contentious discussion, um, is the fear that we are going to empower the teachers with the ability to connect with all the students with empathy and understanding? 
I, I grew up in a predominantly white school my entire life. Uh, I'm black, uh, just in case you're wondering. Um, uh, and even though I did all the things that the other students did, I spoke the same way uh, whenever possible. Um, I, I made sure I was non-threatening in every way since uh, in every way possible. Um, you know, but I always knew I was different. I, I could see it, I could feel it, I was treated differently. I could even smell it sometimes, and, and I can't explain that smell. But um, I remember a guidance counselor in high school once, you know, without me even uttering a word, he says to me, let me guess, uh, you want to be either a rapper or an NBA star. And I think back to that, and I think, wow, like, what would have a deep equity program done for you to better understand that? That is such a terrible thing to say. Um, and for me, as a person that loved technology and design, that was a missed opportunity. Um, I remember walking my dog as an 11 year old and a school bus coming by and this kid screaming out the N word. And I thought, why are they saying that to me? And my father sat me down and explained to me. So coming to this meeting today, I learned that racism doesn't exist. So that must have been a different time or different universe. But again, you know, the education system to me must have failed those kids in some way or shape or form from them to feel empowered to say the things that they said as I walked the dog at 11 years old. And so as I have an 11 year old daughter, I just don't even want to think about her in a similar situation. So as I read more and more about the deep equity program and its purpose, I think, you know, wow, like what this would have done for me many moons ago, but now I have to stand here on behalf of my own kids. And therefore, if you haven't told her, I'm in up. deep support of the deep equity program. So thank you everybody. Thank you. After Mr. Doyle, Barb. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Doyle. I live in St. Charles. My son is a, will be a sophomore at East High School next year. I want to thank the board for its expressed commitment to equity. I want to thank everyone in this room, no matter what side you're on, for caring enough about our community to come out here tonight and share your feelings about this. And there are a couple of things I want to say. I wrote a bunch of pretty words, but I'm going to put them to the side. Um, the barn door is open. My, the gentleman who just left the stand was exactly right when he said that all of the conversations that we're having here are really proving that we need to have this conversation. The division already exists. The misunderstanding already exists. We've heard from our teachers about, and thank you to our teachers for, uh, for your commitment to learning and your commitment to addressing the needs of, our, of all of our kids, all of our kids. I worked for a Fortune 500 company in Naperville. Like a lot of corporations, my company has a robust uh, program of employee resource groups that are designed to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Because my company believes, based on the science, that diverse teams are more innovative and higher performing teams than non-diverse teams. That's the science. The kids who understand this and who have committed to what I've committed to, which is to convert their unconscious bias into conscious inclusion, are going to be better colleagues in the workplace. They're gonna be able to work with people in a more productive way. And I have to say to my friends and neighbors who are standing behind me, who think that uh, critical race theory is about indoctrination and about shame and about blame. My experience in the workplace is that I've committed to these programs. And this year, my black colleagues invited me to serve as the co-lead for a group called EcoEssence, which is the ERG committed to the development of African and African-American employees. They didn't look at me and say, you're a white man. You can't possibly understand. You're the problem. They looked at me and they said, we appreciate your passion. We appreciate your allyship. We want you to be with us. And that is the way we are doing these conversations in my workplace. So in conclusion, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, okay? We're already having the conversation right now. And 
the best you can hope to do is to stop it where it's at. Is that the best you can hope the best is to continue the conversation and allow us to understand each other. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, Barb, and I'm not sure if it's an H or a K. Do you have a Barb? Okay, all right. Uh, Mike Floyd, possibly? Mike? No Mike that wants to speak. Okay, well. That concludes citizens' comments. I know we've been sitting here for a while. Are we uh, looking for a break and getting some head nods? Yes. Okay, we're going to take a recess for five minutes. It is 10.03. We'll be back at 10.07.
Okay, we are going to begin again. Back from recess at 1020. Next item on our agenda is the committee, committee reports. In the essence of time, we are going to abbreviate this section. Uh, the committee reports are located in your in the pack, board packet so that you can see them on uh, board book. And that would bring us to action. Would anyone like President Barker, can we move up the equity agreement from E and put it in front of all of our action items, please? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I want to explain a little bit about this agenda item. There are actually four options. I'm going to read them and then we are going to go through each option individually. The first option is continue with the agreement using different materials. Option two, continue with the agreement with deep equity materials. Option three, pause the agreement with no penalty. The district would continue the training after completing an equity audit. Option four, termination of the agreement cost $50,521.78. Okay, so do I have a motion for option one? So moved. Do I have a second? Okay, I will second it. Is there discussion? Before we discuss, Mrs. Barker, can I ask a clarifying question? Is yes. the motion you just uh, that Mrs. McCabe just entered, is that as in a vote we're about to vote on or just making it a, um, an, a, an amendment to vote, so to discuss so and yes. then vote? We're gonna vote on each option. Yes or no, okay, thank you. So, and, and I'd like to clarify as well. So are mm -hmm. we going to, um, essentially, if we vote for option one, then we would not have a discussion for option two, three and four, or are we gonna discuss Correct. the options? So, Correct. so if one one of these passes, then the remainder would not be voted on, similar to how we did with the math. Or discussed. So we vote. Or discussed. If everyone votes yes or yes, the first one passes, then that's the end of deep equity discussion. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I understand that. Um, so we can have all of the discussion now, or you can hold discussion to different options. I would prefer um, having not. I've researched now, but all of this happened before I was here and, and a lot of it happened before Mr. Lackner was here. It would at least help me to have all of this, all of the topics discussed before we vote individually, because then if we just vote once and then it's over, I don't, I would want to make sure I have all the information before I make a vote. Thank you. So is there discussion? There is. I would like to make a um, statement. And before I do that, I do have a clarifying question, however. Yes. Um, for option three, where we're take if, if we were to take a pause, Dr. Pearson, would the pause um, begin after the administration and site manager modules finished, or would it begin immediately? So the principals and administrators only have one more training in July, and they will have completed this cycle of training. They've already done three dates. Mm. Um, the way this motion is, is written, it would pause um, after the board votes. So that would not allow for that training to happen. So if you wanted to do that, you would need to amend that motion. Okay. Then the first group of teachers would not begin training until the end of, of July or August. So the contract is in, it's two contracts in three parts. The, the one contract has the administrator training and the teacher leadership training. And then the other contract, a separate contract has the student YES program. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I made a statement. It's, I'm gonna try to read it swiftly because I know we just went through three hours of um, uh, citizen comments, but I wanted to let you know, I took some time to prepare some statements to clear up some of the issues and miscommunications first and then give some feedback regarding this particular issue. We approved the material um, 
this is a, the misnomer. We did approve the material. I approved deep equity knowing and asking Dr. Pearson, my employee, that the administration and site managers go through the material and eliminate, eliminate the critical race theory and contentious material due to the conservative nature of the community. Based on our comparison to Naperville, um, as well as um, D3, uh, or sorry, D204, which is Indian Prairie, myself as well, um, and yet I myself am as well, and yet believe we need to put human rights in a safe, positive environment as a priority, sorry. That one didn't make sense. Um, another misnomer is that the board did not see the materials ahead of time. Again, this is plainly not true. We had all had access a week prior to the vote um, to electronic and paper content. And now that the new members have had the same exposure. What we haven't shared well is that we are only using certain chapters. Chapters one, two, five, focusing on cultural responsive teaching for what we have been told by the administration. The fallout we are seeing is once again, the lack of communication on the part of the district to the public. I apologize for that. I understand your frustration. Communication is our weak point. We must do better. However, there is fake news circulating on social media. media. I invite you to talk to the board, myself and colleagues directly to find out what exactly is the information. Also has been mentioned before, there are um, frequently asked questions and a timeline uh, published on our website. Tonight, we heard that the, contrast co the contract costed cost 400,000. It actually was 89,000 for the professional training itself. Again, one of the things that is out there due to our lack of communication, however. The board acted without an audit. Yes, we had our goals to do an audit. Then in the course of six months from August 20th, uh, 2020 to January, 2021, when doing our job that we were elected to do, we received very reliable data, as several of our instructors said tonight, from math and ELA, from iReady, PSAT, SAT, the student achievement report and discipline reports. The data proved that we have silos of students that are not receiving the academic attention that we committed to. Just to define the silos we spoke of, students of specific race, socioeconomic status, sexual identity, IEP and 504. We don't keep demographics on it, but as we heard tonight, religion can be included in some of our siloed students. So we pivoted, again, doing our job. Personally, I have seen through dozens of student complaints of prejudiced treatment. Those are not one-offs. This is only, this cannot be fixed with a Band-Aid. This needs systemic reform. It is time. It has been going on for decades. It is our job to assess and adjust. And we, need, and we ask to see agencies to start the equity work at the first of the year. We voted in March. The timeline, as I mentioned, is on the website should you have questions. I did have asked to have it emailed to the district. However, it did not happen. I apologize. That brings me to my third point, equity work. I've heard from many constituents about what that word means. We heard it tonight. Here's what it means to me. Equal humane treatment by students, by students, to students, by students, and by faculty. Compassion, understanding, support, and opportunity for equal academic achievement, a positive, safe, compassionate, welcoming, collaborative educational environment where all students feel valued and respected and can contribute and learn in a productive environment. Now, my job is to charge the administration with the how to do that. That is what I did. I have been asked to apologize for that by members of the public. I will not be doing that. I'm an advocate for students and for the community for academics, mental health, and for feeling the love from above. What I will apologize for is the lack of communication this district continues to have. For that, we are responsible and I am personally responsible throughout this process and with other issues. I wanna speak for the board, but I can't, so I'll speak for myself. 
I'm sorry that we have not enveloped the community in the discussion of strategy of the district more, including equity, that we, and I say equity or equality. For me, in my head, it's one we are pushing to rectify. I asked it to be. I'm sorry that deep equity in chapters one, two, and five that were in the first wave of training was not communicated that way. I asked it to be. There are pages circulating in social media that we never even saw, that our administrators never even saw. I'm sorry this issue has splintered this community and brought out the ugly. I won't give you a we are better than this speech. I've given plenty of those, though we are. That represents my fourth point for com communication. It has been dismal on all fronts. From the board, the district, and quite frankly, and I know I'll get slaughtered for this, but the public. We have constituents approaching students' speakers negatively. Stop doing that, please. It is very hard for them to come forward and talk about their stories. It discourages them from speaking. It takes courage for them to advocate for themselves. We are the adults in the room. Let us set the example. Starting in August, I would like to hold weekly office hours for two-way communication for anyone who wishes to talk about anything in the community, the community that I love, that I've been in my whole life. That's what I can do. What can you do? I thought, President Barker, maybe we can put this on the agenda next month for discussion so we cannot be on the same page for some kind of communication strategy. Also, I'd like to see the board go through training um, with an equity program, whatever we decide, as many constituents have suggested. Soon we'll be going through trauma-informed training via SB 2109. And honestly, the rest of us should go through um, mental health first aid training as well. Today, I'm gonna vote to pause this mess and let the district get organized over the summer. Honestly, I wanted to abstain from all these, I wanted to abstain from all these motions because quite frankly, I'm not a big fan of any of them. But a lane of no action is a cop out. I wanna see administrators and site managers finish and Dr. Taylor work up a plan to train the trainer program with whatever materials to roll out to the teacher she favors. Deep equity, not deep equity, if deep, deep equity is too obstructive, then she can find whatever works for her. Please remember, this is going to be a professional learning program, not for students. I feel at this point, we certainly have had the public weigh in, and I wanna thank you all for your time and effort to share your thoughts, opinions, and hearts via email, phone, and text in person. I hear you and I thank you. Anyone that reflects the needs I spoke about earlier, talking about culturally responsive teaching, not critical race theory, anything, and I mean any program that is, is good by me. Help kids feel, perform, and exist equally. I would have liked to see a motion that provided the solution on today's agenda. I'm disappointed it is not. An equity, equal treatment, equality program, whatever you wanna call it, falls in line exactly with the com commitments of this board, as one of our families stated today. We need to get it done sooner, way sooner than later for the sake of our kids. The only thing I was gonna add at the end is that I do represent a minority on this board, not by race, but by many of our silos that I described. And I feel it in the district as well. So I understand a little bit of what some of our families go through. So thank you board for humoring me with my very long statement. And um, hopefully you understand where I lie now. Is there any other discussion? Yes, <clears throat> I will try to be more brief than Mrs. Ms. Weibel. Um, so uh, as a new board member, it's really hard to know exactly what to do in these situations. I personally, while there are other parents on the board, that's, that's not my point. I'm always going to be a mom, and that's where I lead in my decisions. And tonight, I definitely want to thank everybody for coming out and speaking. I've done it a lot. I don't know if any of you have ever been here when I have, but they have, and it's hard. And I, I, I want to 
tell you all thank you for coming because I really did want to hear everything that you all said. So thank you. I know it's late. It's late for all of us, but thank you for coming. It's clear that you have passion for your children and we do too. I'm going to put a little bit of myself out there, try to be as brief as I can. Sorry. Um, I'm we have to do equity work, whatever it looks like, whatever it ends up being, I'm only one vote of seven. And I feel equity work is important. Inclusion work is important. My father did this through what was at the time Bell Labs, but that then turned into AT&T in the 70s. And he led those groups. And to me, that's what I grew up knowing. I never knew anything different. I had a gay brother who then killed himself because he wasn't accepted. And I honestly take that forward for each and every one of your children, whether you want me to or not, I care for all of your kids. And I, I don't want any politics at, at our table in, in our classrooms, not unless it's significant to the class being instructed. That's important to me. And I can't say I agree with any of you out there politically. First of all, I have to be nonpartisan and I don't speak for the board, that's Mrs. Barker. I speak for myself. I'm just telling you that there isn't a place for politics unless it's relevant in the classroom. But do we see the bigger picture? We have to create a system for our students because it's not just my kid or your kid, it's all of our children. And it's the children of the entire community here. We have to meet all of their educational needs and we have to meet all of the educational needs for every student. So it's so all the people in the community that are upset about critical race theory, I was too, just so you know. I've been answering hours and hours of emails and phone calls, not because I'm some big hero, but because I wanted to do this work. But what upsets me is that it wasn't communicated to you guys by the administration that those divisive chapters and sections that I fought hard to get you to see, they're not even being taught to our teachers. And one of the reasons why I know the senior leadership team, excuse me, the one of the reasons why I know that is because I spent countless hours of my last two weeks contacting admin and, and educators in our district who've been utilizing those trainings, as well as other districts that have used it in Naperville, in Indian Prairie. I've spent all that effort because this was important to me. It's important to me and all of you who came out to tell us how important it was to you. There are students here in passionately begging for help. And I have to listen to them because that's what we're here for. We're here for the kids. I'm here for your kids. I'm here for your kids. That's what we're all here for is my imp impression. But what certainly would have helped is having it communicated to the district and to the parents and to the staff and to the board that we were customizing this and we didn't even use any of that. What I don't understand, and I had a conversation with Dr. Pearson this week, I don't understand why that wasn't communicated. It makes no sense to me. So whoever's job that was to do certainly would have made this a three hour less long meeting. If we all understood that that wasn't being taught, I would assume that a lot of people who are upset about it wouldn't be here tonight because that isn't part of this program. It was customized. Is that correct, Dr. Pearson? Yes, we've used portions. So the critical race theory, the people are upset about that is not being taught to our senior leadership teams. So we did not use the social dominance and social justice portion of the training. Oh, we did not use that section because we asked that they emphasize the, um, the connection, the belonging portion and the, uh, uh, cultural responsive teaching practices. So those are the pieces that we've emphasized. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on chapter three. So would that have been important information to, I, I'm guessing, and this is a rhetorical question because me being new, I don't know that you can answer me, but that should have been communicated. And it certainly would have made my last two weeks a lot easier. I wanted to connect with everyone who reached out to us and believe me, all the board will nod their head. We were getting an email every few minutes today. We got a lot of emails today. And unfortunately, I couldn't read them all. After four o'clock, I couldn't read them all. But I tried. Had that stuff been communicated, that can't happen again. And I'm not comfortable pausing a project, uh, um, a learning PLC for our educators 
that our kids desperately need. I'm not comfortable telling them no. But what I won't do again is go through this. It's unacceptable. We have to communicate to our community, to our parents, to our teachers, to our students. Half these people out here think it's a curriculum for our students. It isn't. Why? Why is that? Probably because it wasn't communicated. So next time, we can't do this. Our community deserves better. Our kids deserve better. So I'm sorry, I totally was not shorter than you. No, no and Mrs. Bell, Mrs. Bell, I agree with you. And I agree with you and that's what I said, except for it is also the responsibility of the board. It falls well, on yeah, but I just too. got here in May 3rd. So what? I'm gonna start being who I am now. I couldn't, I'm glad we get, I get to re-vote on this sort of because but I don't wanna really get back into the mess. We need to go forward from whatever was decided before I got here. But this part of it not being communicated, it's all of the responsibility. But We're right, all at and the table. I'm not okay with it ever again. Well, I agree. I've been screaming and, I, and yelling and to and get more communication. Thing, I'm with but you. We're all sitting at the same table, just to remind you. What okay. a, I so, don't understand what so you're saying. I'm going to, I'm just going to jump in. Um, communication, obviously, is uh, something that we can all apologize for. Um, at this time, though, I, I would like to move on. Um, just see if anybody else has any more. Well, the motion that's on the floor is in regards to. I'm sorry, I tried. Um, I'm trying better. The motion on the floor is that we maintain the contract, but we change the materials. So, Dr. Pearson, could you speak a little bit about what that might look like? Well, so our trainer for the administrators has actually been Trudy Ariaga, who is the retired superintendent from Ventura County um, Schools in Ventura, California. Um, she actually wrote another book called Opening Doors, which is on cultural competence. Um, she has she has used portions of the deep equity material in our administrator training, but she's trying to understand and be responsive to what our needs are as a community. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, we spent a lot of time on tone and trust and personal journey, which are the first two sections of deep equity. And then in our last training, she spent some time doing some of the cultural competence uh, training that she has also um, written on, as well as started working with us on um, the cultural responsive teaching practices. I think at the end of the day, um, our goal is that really we have three things come out of this training. One is that our students can be seen and heard for who they are, students and staff can be seen and heard for who they are in our schools, that they feel safe to learn, um, and that we have the right strategies um, and tools to be responsive to all of them, the learners that are in front of us. And so um, th there's, there's a lot that goes with that, and, and um, this is why a, a program like this is so important for um, our staff, um, and it's one of the reasons that we started with the staff, with the administrators and then teacher leaders, um, was so that we could begin to understand some of the challenges that we face as a district in light of some of this information. Now, it is clear that in Deep Equity um, and in Gary Howard's work, social dominance and social justice issues are a part of that curriculum. In our case, we haven't spent a lot of time on it because we wanted to really work on those other two components. Um, so that's that's just how it happened uh, for us uh, after the conversations that we had with Dr. Ariaga. Um, I think if we were to change materials, we would want to maybe move to opening doors or some of the other uh, materials on culturally responsive schools, culturally responsive leaders, uh, Corwin Press. Um, is a very large professional development company and they have several other tools and resources that we could use if that is our focus if we if we if this motion was to pass um would we have the opportunity to see those materials before going forward yeah i think we would just have to bring them back and have the board review them and make them available for review before we um, I, I, 
just to briefly well, then, uh, i think in the back they're having trouble hearing again would you say that again Dr. i just Jason? said yes we would definitely want to bring those materials back before we move forward um just briefly um my experience is as both as an educator <laughs> as a human being is that it's always about relationships it's always about the connection and those biases that I have, um, I work really hard. Um, I've called myself an anti-racist racist. I have to work hard at that every day. This entire um, process, uh, looking at this program has really made me have to reflect on my own thinking and decision-making. I do believe that in or I think we've heard from our teachers that they are looking for those connections and those tools that will make their um, responses to students stronger and better and without bias. We've heard from our students about their experiences. I take that very seriously. I also agree with everybody who said, I appreciate the community and their passion. Um, I have also been somebody who has yelled at school boards myself. However, I am also in a position where I think we need to do, um, but I would agree with Mrs. Bell, we need to move forward. So I will vote yes for this um, particular motion. I'll vote yes for a couple of these, these motions because I believe we do need to do this training, this professional learning um, before we, um, and I do want the audit to happen. Um, I think having our staff start this journey um, is really critical to being able to open up next year with with, uh, I, with uh, insights on how we can be better as educators. So that's where I am. Dr. Pearson, for how long would the open-ended nature of the existing contract stand? Meaning for how long would we have to select from other Corwin-related materials so Corwin indicated that they would be willing to work with us. I mean, I, I'm not sure that it would be, you know, for, for years to come, but I think that they know that we have a pending audit and that that's a possible scenario. They also said that they would be willing to work with us to adjust our contract to potentially use different materials. Um, so I would think we would want to make that selection, um, you know, within the course of the, the year at the latest, but I, I would think that they would be willing. Our contract actually goes through the year uh, so I think they would be willing to work with us, um, you know, through the term of the current contract. Can you further clarify? So on the third option, we would continue the training. Is that specifically we're tied by the contract to do equity? Or does that mean that after we complete the audit and assessments done, needs are identified, then we would have the flexibility to work and consult on what we those so that you know that was that's kind of combining to one and three what you just said so i think the intent of these options is just to pause and then continue with deep equity for option three okay. um so that would be a combination of one and three and of course we can do a motion that would recognize that instead of having these four I make a motion to add a fifth option that is a combination of option one and option three. I would suck it. If that's wait, the right, we have a motion on the table. <laughs> that's way too fast. <laughs> yes, we we need to communicate well with each other. Um, so it, feel free once we're done with this motion, this discussion, then this motion, then, then we can add in um, uh, another option. So let's call um, the, let's call if, for the Well, I, I've not. Oh, I'm sorry. Not, um, and I want to clarify too, uh, were option one to pass, then Mr. Lackner would not be able to make this motion, am I correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so there, I still have some concerns. Um, I, I, I understand the, the communication aspect and I, you know, I, that needs to be better. But we still haven't done the audit. I think the audit was, we, we made a promise we were going to do the audit first. We didn't. Um, we've had three years of declining SAT scores. And I 
I see our problems as academic because I see our mission as academic. Um, I do have one quick question if I can ask, is the intent then not to use the yes materials in, in the future? Is so the way that these options are written, if we were to pause, we would pause all of the contracts. So that would be the yes materials also. So when we came out of the audit, then we would also continue with the yes materials as well as the future materials. Okay, so I, the, I guess the other question I have is, was the, was the yes book made available to the public? Because I, I actually had a couple people contact me and they told me that it was, that it was not made available. For yes, it was available. Uh, were the DVDs made available? Please stop shouting. Were the DVDs made available for viewing? Were people able to, to because I think that's that's kind of important. I think the other thing that concerned me is that they had 20 minutes to look at. As I recall, there were two workbooks, which totaled somewhere around 700 pages with, the, with I think, four DVDs attached. Um, I that doesn't seem like an adequate time for the, for the public to be able to see that. So that's a concern that I have. Um, I think, you know, you, you had mentioned that you didn't delve too much into chapter three, but the, the political nature with that, that dominance issue, um, the social dominance issue is, is still there. And I still find that problematic. And I think, I think that is much of the reason we have a lot of people out here wearing red shirts and objecting to the material. I think that is probably what they find to be the most objectionable part of this. And so I really don't think that, uh, that a program, I, I don't like the idea of a program that begins with people assuming negatives that they don't necessarily believe about themselves. I don't think that's a way to bring about unity. Um, and I certainly want to see unity with, within this, within the, with, well, within our community. Um, the other comment was made that the word, this is not being done uh, for students. If, if it's not being done for students, why as a school district would we be doing it? It's going to be filtering down to students in some way. And because of that, I, I think we need to make certain always, whenever this is the case, and whenever we're doing anything, we should be doing it for students. Um, and we should be made very transparent to the public about precisely what it is we're doing with the, then the hows and the whys, and I don't think we've done that. Um, the question I have is, is this going to become for teachers, should we proceed with this? Is this going to become a condition of their employment or is this something that teachers will be able to voluntarily participate in? This particular contract is, uh, is for volunteer teacher leaders at each school of uh, building leadership. But will all teachers be exposed then to the to the material. In other words, will, there, will any portion of this in any way become part of anyone's evaluation or a checkoff point on someone's evaluation? Well, I think that there are, so if you, the, the two things that I talked about, which is tone and trust, um, and which is about classroom learning environment and culturally responsive teaching practices, which now we have Illinois standards around that as well. Um, that were adopted. And so we will be expected to have you know, using some of those kinds of strategies in classrooms. But I think many of those things, although not specifically identified, are part of our teacher evaluation process already. If we look at the Danielson framework, but many of those things are represented as we think about responding to all learners in the classroom and making sure that our classrooms are safe places for students to learn, making sure that we're using the right instruction strategies. These are just additional tools in the teacher's toolbox. So no teachers are going to be required to participate in any of this training? Not under this kind. This is for building leadership teams and administrators and then students that want to be in the yes club. Dr. Pearson, you mentioned uh, the ISBE standards associated with um, culturally responsive teaching. My understanding is those standards today are associated only with new teachers, teachers who are in training today and, and require licensure, is that correct? Correct, they are part of the uh, uh, licensure process. So they were written for higher education, uh, but I think some of the things that are in those standards are things that we aspire to. That was my point, is that it's part of our current evaluation framework. Thank you, totally understandable. Um, Follow-up question on that. Uh, we expect to see guidance on an equity scorecard entry 
into the school district report card that's managed by the state. We expect that this summer. How much of this training will put us in compliance or secure for us a positive rating associated with that state's performance requirement there? That's a great question. We don't know exactly what the components are going to be included in that, in that requirement. So um, I think that many of the issues that we would be supporting our teachers in developing and our administrators in understanding certainly would give us an, a lens to be able to address some of the equity questions that are being asked of us by the state. Just a couple, uh, in the essence of time, a couple of quick comments. Um, my issue has been, it continues to be, the lack of a strategy that we've put in place for the district or any type of plan to comprehensively address our diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in our district. Um, even just tonight, hearing and listening to the comments, there were several uh, examples given where it's apparent that we have gaps in terms of our curriculum. To my point of why I think an audit is so critical so that we can understand where all of our needs are, of which professional development and perhaps some type of student training as well may be a solution also. Um, finally, I, I think as the equity standards get finalized at the state level, I think it would be very important to have that at a future agenda meeting for the board so that we are fully up to speed and understand what part we play in that for our district. Um, and then finally, just thank you to everyone who spoke and attended tonight. Um, this is democracy. And whether we agree or not, um, I appreciate you taking the time, um, whether just to attend um, and or to speak. So thank you. It's my turn, all right. Um, so I have, I have two I have two questions. Um, when will we see the audit uh, inf information about uh, selecting an audit? Yeah. So we actually have three quotes from three different companies to do that for us. We are waiting for a fourth um, from another company that can't provide it until the week of the 20th, which is next week. Um, so as soon as we have all four of those options, we'll be looking at them. Um, I'm going to share them with you, Mrs. Barker, and then we'll uh, figure out they're they're very different in their approach and so i'd like us to talk about that but i hope hope we can bring something to the board for consideration in july okay um then the other other question i had okay, if even if we were to terminate the contract uh we, we voted to terminate the contract today when i was reading the uh, information that we received on the contract um, my understanding was um, even if we sent that information tomorrow, um, it has um, 60 days until it's actually canceled. And so they would continue to August 15th, is that correct? We would be responsible for the costs of any of the training that was scheduled between now and the next 60 days. So that would be the administrator training in July and then the trainings that occur uh, with teachers at the beginning of uh, end of July, early August. And possibly any other incidentals that uh, travel and, and uh, lodgings and things travel like that. Travel is included in the cost of the contract. Okay. So that's on top of the 50,000 plus? No? It's, in, it's included. Inclu oh, it's it's included in the fee for okay. the day. Could, can I ask a clarifying? If we pause, what does that mean financially they are willing to just change our dates to tbd and and work with us to figure out the time that's the most appropriate if we find in the audit that um the work that the, that the group the deep equity company would be doing doesn't match what we need then we was, would have to then go back to where we if we were to um ending the contract Correct. Correct. But again, I think that Corwin, with their breadth of materials, could potentially have something that would um, be available that we could then just shift that to those. So materials. that that though would not be part of our current motion for pausing, if I'm understanding. That would be the motion that Mr. Lackner Lackner hopes to make. Correct. 
Mrs. Barker, is it possible for me to, um, I'm going to say the wrong word, rescind my motion? No, but it can be amended. So I think that's the word everyone's looking for. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Yep. So I'll, I'll make a motion to amend option one to strike out the words. Um, sorry, guys, I'm writing small here. D to replace the words, continue with the agreement with, pause the agreement with no penalty using different materials, and add the sentence following the district would continue after completing an equity audit. So the new, uh, the amended option one would read, pause the agreement with no penalty using different materials, period. The district would continue after completing an equity audit. Mr. Wagner, before we make that amendment, would we wanna add that the administrative and site managers finish complete their training with current materials before we shift their trajectory into a new direction with different materials. Can I ask a clarifying question? We have, we, we have to finish the motion first. Oh, I'm sorry. Or is that a totally different amendment? Okay. Because we don't, we don't. I, I think that'd be a different amendment. Yeah. We can't discuss it till we get a, uh, a second on it. We need to okay. vote on. Right. I need a second. I'll second. Okay. So now we need to. Can you reread the motion yeah. in its entirety? Because yeah. it was a, a bit yes. broken up, and I'd like okay. to hear it in its entirety. So option uh, 1.5 is pause the agreement with no penalty using different materials, the district would continue the training after completing an equity audit. So we're pausing, equity audit, continuing with different materials potentially. I do have a clarifying question. I don't understand exactly with no. Yes, yeah, okay, I guess for this discussion now. I don't know what it means with no penalty. I don't know there's, what that means. There's company no, or, or there, there's no monetary penalty to us to pay them. To um, pause. Right to pause. Dr. Pearson will if we do not finish the administrators workshop, do they still get administrative academy <laughs> credit? We we can do something different okay. with them to meet that requirement. Okay. It may also be on an equity topic, but it wouldn't be with defective materials. I'm sorry. Um, just, just a, a point of order here. I guess um, we need to vote on the amendment, and then we can discuss. I apologize. Okay, Marcin, would you please call roll? I'm not clear what we're voting on. <laughs> what? We're vote, yeah, we're voting to amend the motion to that uh, the amendment that uh, uh, Mr. Lackner made, and then I reread. So we're just okay. voting on that's what's on the table for discussion. But okay. well, what that amendment would do would be to change the wording of option one. Correct. So we're voting on that change to the wording of option one. Is that correct? Correct. We are not. We are not voting. We're on not the voting new, on the thing. We're just voting on the wording we're of the motion. On the new amendment, rather than the amendment itself. I want to clarify Cor that point. Correct. So we are we are voting board. on the amended language. Okay. That's it. And we will discuss I, and we will vote <laughs> on the actual uh, uh, motion. Okay, so we're just voting for the words. Mrs. Fairgreed. Uh, yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Bell? Yes. And Mrs. Barker? Yes. Now, discussion. So, so I'm going to ask again, Dr. Pearson, 
whether or not the administrators will be able to get their, acad uh, their administrative academy credit if we pause, if we pass this, this option. We can do an administrator academy in July without using the equity materials. It may still be on an equity topic, um, but we would have to choose from the state list of approved academies. So we couldn't use um, Trudy Ariaga's materials for that if we paused it. We could not use deep equity materials for that if we paused it. But what about the book you were referring to with Trudy Ariaga? Opening Doors. Is that uh, from Corwin? It's from Corwin. Okay, so we couldn't use it. We, it's potential, it, we could potentially use it. We should, could still have Trudy come, but we also have to meet the requirements of the Administrator Academy. Right. Um, so we would have to talk with Colin about whether or not they have something that they could provide. So we could use the facilitator, just not deep equity materials. Okay. Potentially. It's, it's a detail we'd have to work out. So just for me, this motion, and all this discussion, there's just so many maybes on the table and this is what gets us in trouble and what makes me feel really uncomfortable. I, we have got to get more specifics for just me to feel comfortable and then communicate those specifics out to the public. This making decisions on the fly is what's got us here in the first place. And I just want to, I just okay, want to guys, we need yeah, to continue guys, the meeting. We're sorry. It's just getting so late. I just, I just want to say that's what my whole like lengthy statement was about is that we have gotten here in the first place. And it, it I just, I'm not, in, I mean, I'm not I'm in support of this quite frankly, but doesn't mean that we can't be in support of it a little bit down the road, but we just have got to stop and talk about it when it's not 11 PM. We're trying to figure out what's going on. I think I think what the uh, what this amended language gets us is a couple of different things. Um, it allows us to avoid um, a substantial cancellation cost. It allows us to have Dr. Taylor join us on seven one and participate in the discussion of which content would be used. It allows us the opportunity to watch what the state puts out in terms of what will come this summer associated with the equity scorecard on which this district will be rated. And you know, we've, we've entered into a commercial contract with an organization. They're being gracious in offering us the flexibility to alter how we consume their content. I think this, this gets us to the point of, of being able to say, this is the right approach and it buys us the time to get that right while balancing out these other issues of avoided cost, Dr. Taylor joining to have a voice in the process as well as the potential to use this investment to stay or get in compliance with whatever that scorecard requirement will be. And I and appreciate that, Mr. Wagner, but if I'm understanding it properly, you're not gonna have consistency with finishing the training with the administrators and the site managers. So they're gonna jump into a different program to finish up whatever they learned. And so they're midstream and something that they found very helpful and fruitful. And so they're not gonna get the rest of it. So when you take a driving course and you don't get to learn how to parallel park, did anyone do that when they were younger? You, you never learn how to parallel park. So I, I just feel like it's really important for whatever they're doing to finish and then put a pause. That's why I asked about making the amendment for them to finish whatever their program is. And then, because we're, we're basically saying they can't look at any of the Corwin material from deep equity. So let's say they like chapter one or they like part of chapter two or half a chapter five or whatever that was effective that wasn't that was mainstream enough for the community they're not gonna be able to use it, utilize it and so i look at that as as a huge downside because now there's no continuity for them and so i just think it's it's not a palatable solution for me so while i appreciate you're saying it brings in other opportunities we're basically essentially throwing the baby out with the bathwater if there's anything productive in the material that they've learned so far. And so I'm just not comfortable with that. Could I make an amendment to your amendment? Or can I not do that right now? So, 
I can ask the, the question before we proceed. Would, would were we to to do this with different materials? Obviously, they'd be from the same publisher because that's who we have the contract with. Um, would we have a period for the board and the public to again be able to review the materials in depth? Yes. Dr. Pearson, what is your expert opinion about finishing your training? Yeah, so I, where we are in the training right now is with the inst instructional, culturally responsive instructional practices. And then we also were going to spend some time in July talking about using data uh, um, to understand um, where equity gaps exist. Um, in our schools. And so that's the Administrator Academy. I don't remember the exact title, but it was around um, using data. Um, it is quite probable that we can just do that training separate from deep equity. I guess to keep this clean, I would, if we're going to pause, we need to just pause and we'll, we'll do what we need to do with principals in July. Um, that would be separate. And then we can pick this back up once the audit is complete and you're ready to move forward as a board. I I'm not comfortable taking that next step because it, just like you said, there's a lot of gray there. And I would prefer that we, if you're gonna pause, just pause and we'll come back to this work when the board is ready to do it. Um, how long will it take to, is, was there any con consensus among the four different uh, companies about how long it takes? So um, there are two of them that feel like they can get it done in the fall. Um, I think the, the one, now we're missing one group, but most of them need about three or four months to, to complete the audit. Um, so the one that has the most aggressive timeline says that they would have a report to the board in December. Oh. Let's clarify what you said. So for you, a clean pause, so option yeah, I just option three is what you is what no what's on the table the motion that's on the table I think we can do okay. uh, from an administrative standpoint with the administrator training in July. We will just do something different. We'll do an administrator academy potentially around the topic that okay. I just mentioned, the data using data. Okay. Um and not deep equity. Okay. Until the board's ready to continue with Corwin, okay. whatever materials you decide to use. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And you personally don't feel that that would be in, a, in an interruption of the continuity? Um, I think that there are so many issues to work on around equity that we can certainly look, use, go, and we had already planned to look at that administrator academy as our framework. And we certainly can do that and not need, we don't need the deep equity materials to complete that administrator academy. And just to, just to clarify, you are going to the part that I think we heard so much about tonight that we really need, which is translating how does the data where we're dropping in academic achievement and SEL and all these other components, how does that translate to the equity work? And that's the part you have left to do in your training. That's a critical next step, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm going to say a few words. Um, I feel like investing in this professional learning is really to build awareness and a shared understanding and a lens through which to view our systems and our structures in place for our administrators and teachers. And without the shared lens to look through and the shared understanding surrounding equity and inclusion, they won't be able to identify systemic barriers and revise them. They won't be able to look at the data. Um, and make a decision about what, what do they need to do next. Um, additionally, administrators and teachers will be able to, with this professional learning, will be able to effectively create a culture revision to support an improved learning environments for all of our students. Besides, despite all of the best intentions, inequity lives in good schools. It just does. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I want to welcome our children back in the fall into healthy healing learning spaces with our educators having or will potentially get the professional learning to be responsive to all of their educational needs. 
I've said this part before, um, I will support this professional development on equity because it's the right thing to do. The data that we've seen over the last two years, we've had teacher after teacher, we've had parents and students after students and alumni bravely take the time to communicate a very deep need for this type of learning to take place. And I won't ignore their voice. I, um, I do think that um, this particular motion is, uh, it's an acceptable motion. We're moving forward still. Um, we are getting the audit. We're learning a little bit more about what we know. Um, it, it would allow for our uh, new director to put, put a plan together in place that we all will then be able to look at, have the knowledge of, and there won't be any, I guess, surprises. Um, there were several other options that I, I would be comfortable voting for as well. Um, but uh, this particular option has some logic behind it. So if there, is there any other discussion? I'm just concerned and a little bit confused how um, to you, Dr. Pearson, how if, what you guys were going to do next was get into the data. Do you mean that was the next session? The July session was you were going to get into the data? So in July, we're also, in addition to having a training with Deep Equity, we were trying to use it for our Administrator Academy, which means we have to meet the state standards and we were going to use Deep Equity materials to help us with that. So section five is about systemic change and of course, understanding systems includes looking at data. So we were going to use that framework to help us um, with use of materials to help us with that uh, with that training. We can do that training without deep equity materials, which it sounds to me like that's what the direction we're going. So I'm just saying I don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we're continuing with one group and not with another group and this group is paused. That's too confusing. If we're going to pause, we need to pause for everyone and we'll do what we need to do with administrators um, in July. That's not using, that would not include deep equity materials. But you could still use Trudy to maybe go over the um, data that you're going to work on? We're going to look at the framework and see what makes the most sense. Probably not. I think we would save Dr. Ariaga to come back when we continued with administrators when after pausing the contract. Uh, I call the question. Okay. I'm going, yes, I will say what the motion is again. Okay, so we are going to vote on pausing the agreement with no penalty using different materials the district would continue the training after completing an equity audit. Yes, again. Okay. okay, we need, we do need a motion and a second. A motion that we vote on what Mrs. Barker just read. Option 1.5. Second. Okay, Ms. Marsan, the roll, please. Mr. Lackner. Yes. Mrs. McCabe. Yes. Mr. McNally. Yes. Ms. Weibel. Yes. Mrs. Bell. Yes. Mrs. Fairbury. Yes. And Mrs. Barker. Yes. Oh, yes, it, the motion passed, 7 zero. Okay. Can we'll I we'll just a... take a few moments before we um, go to the next agenda item. Okay. Yeah. So if you are uh, wanting to go home, you may do so if you were here for that particular purpose. Okay. Bye everyone. Yes. <clears throat> we are not pausing the meeting. We're just allowing you guys to go.
So please don't hang and talk. We need to continue. Come on. Okay, so we're gonna move back up to A. <laughs> yeah, okay, so back up to A, which is the uh, adoption of the fiscal year 2020. 2021 community unit school district 303 amended budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Do we have any discussion? I'm taking that as a no. Oh. I just want to clarify that um, we've gone through the budget and in great detail at the business service meeting for anyone that might be watching or listening. Yes, we have definitely gone through and in much great detail. Okay. Discussion closed. Ms. Marston, please. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Fairgree? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. And Mrs. Barker? Yes. Okay. Next item appointment of the treasurer for fiscal year 20. 21-22. So moved. Second. For your appointee. Yes, I, I have to read that. I apologize. <laughs> that's like, that's okay. I, I did that. And then, um, so the administration is recommending that Mr. Justin Attaway be appointed to board treasurer for fiscal year 2021-22, effective July 1, 2021. We have a motion. So moved. Yeah, or well, they kind of already did. But do we take, do we use them still? Yeah, we're good. All right, I, I'm, we're moving. Okay. No, <laughs> we need to, is there any discussion on it? Just thank you to Dr. Chapman again for all his work for us as a uh, board, as treasurer, and as um, the CFO of the district. Thank you, we will miss you. We look forward to working with Justin, but thank you again for your work. Ditto. Uh, yeah, ditto too. Um, I did ask Dr. Chapman, he will have, he will be present at the last business service meeting. So yeah, okay. Okay, now? Any more discussion? Well, and again, thanks to Dr. Chapman for, for his uh, service to the, to the district. He's done an incredible job in trying to practice. Okay, discussion closed. Ms. Marcian, the roll, please. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Fairgree? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Okay, that moves us to our next agenda item. Um, and it's setting the amount for the treasurer's surety bond. Administration is recommending that the board move that the surety bond 
to be filled by the school board treasurer is hereby established and fixed at 40 million for the fiscal year 2020-21-2022. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Do we have discussion on it? I'm taking that as no discussion. Ms. Marcin, the roll, please. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Fairgreave? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Motion passes. I realized I haven't been doing that. I apologize. Seven zero. Okay, the next agenda item is the approval of the architectural contract contract full. The administration recommends that the board approve the attached AIA contract between Wold and the district. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Great, thank you. Do any discussion? I think like with the budget, it's important to recognize that this contract was reviewed. It went through a vetting process. It was reviewed at business services last in detail. We have some really good terms embedded within this contract. And so it was favorably negotiated. Thank you, Mr. Lackner. Any other comments? Discussion? No, I will take that as discussion closed. Ms. Marcy on the roll, please. Mrs. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Fairgreed? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes, motion passes 7-0. Okay, that brings us to early release. Okay, do I have a motion to approve every other week early release be added for pre-K through eight beginning in the 2021-2022 school year? So moved. I have a second. Second. We have discussion on it. I'd like to amend it. So here we go again, I'm sorry. Um, I would like to amend that we do once a month for, I'm, I would like it to be for elementary. So just to be clear, you wanna do twice a month for middle school and once a month for elementary? That's where my biggest issue is, is with elementary. So that's what, that's what I'm proposing. Yes. I just wanted to make sure. Thank yeah, you. no, you're not. there was a big pause. Okay, I'm gonna, re I'm gonna read that again it, as, it, as it was amended. Um, I have too many papers in front of me, sorry guys. Okay, um, motion would be to approve one time per month for elementary, that would be pre-K through five, and every other week for six through eight, beginning in the 2021-22 school year. I'll second. Okay. So now we need to vote an amendment on the words. If I send the roll, please. Mrs. Fairgreave? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Okay, now do we have discussion? Um, because of the timing of, because next year is the year after COVID, and that we have not had the extended school day um, as we had proposed for this year, I would really like to hold off um, at least for the 21, uh, 22 school year and at the elementary. I think that we need to have more discussion about it. Um, I understand, I, I thought the presentation was very well done it really, um, our teachers work really hard 
I get all of the pieces to it. I'm just having a hard time coming out of um, COVID with having a shortened school day and not having had a chance to do the full year, giving the teachers their time to do professional um, learning committees uh, as well. So community. So that's where, that's the reason behind. I, if it was a different year this year, if it was, um, and we had uh, more time to see if those extended days meeting the needs or not, that would, it, this might've been different. So that's hurts. I, I'm in agreement with um, the majority of your, your comments, Mrs. McCabe. Um, however, I am not in support of continuing or doing an early release for the middle school um, or the elementary really at this time. I think, again, we're coming off of a, more than a year uh, with a COVID impact. And I think it's important to maximize the hours we have available for the students with the teacher. Dr. Pearson, I'm gonna defer to you and ask your opinion again. Do we, because we're making an amendment without conferring with staff, do you have a feel for how staff will respond? And, and I'm not saying this as a slight, it's just that I don't know that we've talked to them. Um, do you have an idea of how they respond to the amendment from two to one for elementary? So I think the recommendation is two for both levels um, from the, the team that put this together. Um, but I also feel like if you are not gonna support twice a month for elementary and middle school, then once a month is better than not at all. So I guess what I would prefer is that we do move forward with, or what I think the team would prefer is that we move forward with something. Um, the recommendation is twice a month for both levels, but if you're not, if you're not comfortable with that, then we would like to move forward with something. Is that gonna mess mess up busing on the off day? No, because we'll do the once a month for elementary will be on the same day that it is for middle and high school. Theirs is twice a month, but so it will be on one of the two days that middle school and high school are releasing so that, um, oh, now let me just think about this for a minute. Does it mess up for elementary? Just thinking. Does, if we, <laughs> If we do an early release at the middle, no, because middle school is last. Yes, they're last. Yes, no, but it would because they would be releasing when we're doing elementary dismissal. Yes, so we, we have to do the same for both levels then. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, we have to vote it down. I think yeah. we'd have to vote the amendment down and then go and return to the original amendment or the, the original motion. motion. And then we can amend that one. Yep. They've been looking for transparency and they're seeing it in action yes. <laughs> at 11.30. Very exciting. Okay. All right. Um, is discussion over at this point? Yeah. Okay. Let's call roll then. I make oh, a motion. You have to make a motion. I'm motion sorry. for the amendment to um, once a month early release for elementary, twice a month early release for middle school and high school. Second, so it's not okay. even high school, it's on here. Just, just middle school. Just middle school. That's okay. okay, so we have a motion. Did we have a second? A second. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, great. All right, Ms. Marcin, the roll, please. Mr. Lackner. Yes. No. <laughs> I would like to change my vote. Can I amend my vote to no? Mrs. Barker, can you read? It again, right. please. Yes, please. I will read it again. Okay, so the motion is one early release, one time per month, elementary, and every other week, six through eight. For the beginning of the 2021-22 school year. Now, Mr. Lackner. No. Mrs. McCabe? No. Mr. McNally? No. Ms. Weibel? No. Mrs. Bell? No. Mrs. Fairgreen? No. Mrs. Barker? No. Oh, the motion, the motion fails. Uh, 
seven zero. So we are now back to the original motion. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we, we are good. The motion now is on the table for the original, which for discussion is discussion right now. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So that one is every other week, early release be added for pre K through eighth beginning of the year of 2021 22. So that will not conflict with the bus schedule, Mr. Baird? We just, we have to do the same thing at both levels because if a middle school dismisses early and elementary does not, then we're running buses for both levels at the same time. So it will not conflict with the bus schedule? No. If we, they, as long as both levels do the same thing. Correct. But before we put an amendment on the table, now I'm worried about two levels, two levels of education, primary and, and secondary and six through eight of teachers who would be influenced getting only half of what they, the recommendation was. Just so, to put that out there in discussion. Okay. Uh, Let's make sure we're talking, we're, what the motion is, is what was recommended, correct? correct? Yeah, so, but okay. I'm saying if we were to amend it. Nobody's amended it. No. I'm just <laughs> throwing it out there for anyone that might have pipe dreams in their head. Um, for anyone that might want to amend it, if they were to amend it and cut the time in half, that would might be shocking to staff. So wasn't it also part of their contractual agreement that they were going to get this for yeah. this past school year, but then we couldn't because of yeah. Well, Dr. Pe can you expand on that, Dr. Pearson? Because it, I don't. It was that they would bring a plan to the board for consideration. Right. Yeah. So there was no agreement that this would be received. It wasn't. Yeah. So it wasn't agreed every other week. It was just agreed there would be an early release plan that we would consider. I think it was presumed that there would be a plan and that it would not be rejected. It would be accepted. Well, to, to be honest, there are other people on this board that were not there during the end of negotiations last time. And then, of course, at the beginning of negotiations, several of us were not on the board as well. I still have my concern about elementary. Um, and so I will probably vote no, even though I totally believe in teacher professional learning and that time I just have a concern that next year is the wrong year. So I have a question about plan time. Will this have an impact at all on teacher plan time? I'm Ms. Geyer is going to come talk about that. Did you hear the question? Teacher plan time. So the question I ask is this is would this uh, early release proposal have an impact on teacher plan time we already know that that would would it reduce some contact time but would it have a would it have an impact on teacher plan time if we did not do the early release is that the question or what either so, way what would the impact be on right so as I think the group that presented at the LNT meeting is this is that time for the PLCs grade level and cross grade level to come together to work on whether it's curriculum implementation, um, it's a new learning strategy, it's looking at data and being able to come up with um, the work that they need to do to move kids forward. I guess the question is, so this is an administrative time used for, this is, this is used for teachers, teacher collaboration, as opposed to uh, you know, administrators putting in initiatives or, or whatever, we're talking about teacher collaboration time. So it would actually, um, in one sense, improve, uh, increase their plan time. Yes. So that's, that's what and, I was trying to get at. And just to note, um, at the elementary level, with the extended day, we did increase teacher plan time under the last contract. We did. Um, yes, from 6 to 10. With um, The 6 were all personal plan time in the past. And now with the 10, three of them are PLC and collaboration time. Thank you. I have two clarifying questions. One, therefore, the the, uh, the time that 
students aren't in the building would not be used by district? Well, we, it could be the district initiatives, but the teachers are working on, you know, taking it forward to what they're doing in the classrooms. Okay. So as you know, we all know the professional learning community, the learning is part of that. So it could be learning that the team is doing together. It could be learning they're doing cross um, grade level. Um, you know, I think about the phonics program that you just um, approved is that would be time that we could pull the K-1-2 teachers together to really look at what's happening at kindergarten, first grade to second grade. So we really have a flow to the curriculum going forward. So let me, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, let me just ask my other Absolutely. question. Um, it says every other week. That doesn't necessarily mean twice a month or sometimes five weeks a month. I assume it's whatever the high school does now, correct? Yeah, there's a step, we would follow the high school schedule. But which comes to two times a month? We never have three times a month. I do not know the high school schedule, mm -hmm. but I think, I think we could put that in other, place. Every other week. It's just right? every other week, then yeah. early fall schedule. So it's more than twice a month. So I just want, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify that that it, it, this is for. I think the concern we have in the community is is about academic time, academic plan time. So, I want to clarify this is for academic plan time. Academic, and I would say if there's a social emotional need that the grade level has, um, because of their data, they would certainly have opportunity to look at that social emotional learning also, which as we know, is really important if you want academics to continue to grow. Is there any other discussion? Would it be worth introducing an amendment to do this one time versus two times for, for at both levels? We've tried it now with just at the elementary level. Is it worth the sacrifice to the more the uh, middle school level to have less uh, to reduce the contact time less i wonder even if instead of just once per month and, and does that is that it is once per month an issue with the buses again because it's going to be sort of the same thing no as no? long as both levels do the same thing you're fine but what about the high school the high school is fine they're they're elementary and high school it does mess up high school no no. It, no because we would do no. it on a day when high school was doing it so if high school does it but elementary and middle school do not that's fine because high school is the first route in the afternoon that's right okay that that is, <laughs> yeah. okay don't want to mess up the buses so an option would be <laughs> an option would be to one say once per month or uh, something to the effect of every three weeks so that it I, I could I could vote for an amendment that would be once a month for both levels so that they they do have that opportunity yeah and I will make the amendment that um, I would move that we would um, instead of every other week, once a month for both for uh, pre K eight for early release. I'll second that. Okay, so now we're voting on the amendment words. Ms. Marcy on the roll. Mrs. McKay? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? No. Mrs. Bell? Okay, yes. Mrs. Fairgree? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Motion passes 6 1. Okay, discussion. I guess I'm going to ask the same question that was asked before uh, about doing this for, for one day a month, uh, well, well, once a month for elementary. How is this going to be received by, in, in your view, how is this going to be received by those who 
approaches? Well, again, the recommendation was twice a month from the team, but if, if it's nothing or once a month, I think that they would prefer to at least do it once a month. So that's more than what they're able to do now. I think given the um, unique nature of next year, we're trying something new in the COVID, COVID return time. I think we've, we've struck a middle ground here. So I'm pleased with um, the middle ground. I, I recognize that some folks will be uh, disappointed by the volume of time that's been missed, but it's also an increase. Um, so it's, it's not the entire proposal, but half a loaf. Any other discussion? Okay, discussion. I, I am going to say oh. a comment. I find that we cannot keep to what we believe in, and that we keep changing as we go in what we want. And I find that so totally irritating. Well, I'm sorry. But I think that we've had this discussion about early release, and this was a proposal brought to us and as a board member that ha is going to vote on an issue that I have fought for years to have for teachers, we are going into a very difficult, we're coming out of a very difficult time and that is why I'm doing it. I don't appreciate being considered those comments, Ms. Weibel, and I've asked that we could just get through the vote and let's not. The reason why I said it is because this kind of thing needs to be negotiated at committee. We had discussion about this at committee. And if we didn't like the way it went down, we should have dealt with it at committee, not at this board table. This kind of negotiating needs to be done at a committee. I do, I do agree that um, we probably should have been more clear at the committee level. Um, I, I do remember speaking about it. I do remember uh, there were different commentary. There was the concern regarding the amount of time um, several board members did make. Um, and so this was, this was still the recommendation that came. I, I mean, this was actually, that was actually the second time that we viewed early release information. We viewed it prior to that. We asked them to make changes, correct? Um, this was the change that was made. I think several um, members did feel as though it was still quite a bit. Um, and uh, so I think there was discussion. Um, this was still the recommendation that was made. I just want to back it up. I didn't mean to insult your belief. It's not your belief. It's the lack of parliamentary procedure that we seem to just keep rolling over. That's what I am frustrated with. Okay. Ed, Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. No, so I, I apologize came off that way. It's the parliamentary 47, procedure. I, wanna, oh, I do want to move on to this vote here. Okay. I'm sorry to delay us for another. Given that there there is some divide here, is it is this something? It's is it possible? And and it, it's almost midnight, so I might not be thinking clearly. Is this possibly something we could begin the year with and revisit as the year progresses? I'm happy for us to talk about it after the year starts for a later for the following year. But I really think we need to make a commitment for, for this year. I think families deserve that. Yeah. Okay, so the motion on the table is one time per month for uh, early release to be added for pre-K-8 beginning in the 2021-22 school year. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Marcin, the roll. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? No. Mrs. Bell? I'm hung up on the procedure part of it. I'm sorry. I'm going to abstain. Mrs. Fairbury? No. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Mm. 
Yes. So motion passes six one. Okay. Motion passes, right? Four two one. Okay. That is going to bring us to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the second, the consent agenda? So moved. Yes, I was going to ask that. That's is okay. is there any item anyone would like to pull yes. from the consent agenda? I would like to pull item G, please. Okay. Now, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda except for item G? So moved. Second. Okay, do we have discussion on it? It's consent agenda, what am I asking? Oh my gosh, Ms. Garcia on the roll. Ms. Weibel? Yes. Mrs. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Fairgrief? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Okay, do I have a motion to approve item G on the, that was on the consent agenda? Resolution authorizing the destruction of verbatim recordings of closed board meetings. So moved. Second. Now, do we have discussion? I just usually explain while I pulled this. Thank you, President Barker. So for those new to the board, I have been pulling this item for the last four and a half years. I do not, it, while we follow the protocol of the recommendation of ISBE, I do not approve of the destruction of any verbatim records. Everything is digital. I don't understand why we can't change policy to store digital records. Of closed session. So I always vote no to this. Just letting you know. Any other discussion? Okay, then, Ms. Mercy on the roll. Mrs. Bell? No. Mrs. Fairgrave? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McKay? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Ms. Weibel? No. And Mrs. Barker? No, motion passes 4-3. Okay, so I do wanna note that um, you do have several items for information in your board packet, and that's the FOIA request, the D303 financial report for April, 2021, the Mid Valley financial report for April, 2021, the district enrollment, in the COVID-19 financial impact summary. Does anyone have any new business? No. To reiterate what I mentioned to put on for next time. Yes. Um, so some sort of discussion about um, two-way communication with the public, either some kind mm -hmm. of office hours or something along those lines. Yeah, please. I made note of that. Thank you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other new business items? Can we also put on the agenda for next time to discuss a time frame for this pause? I'm very concerned that we pause it too long. We're doing our students a disservice. So I want to put a time limit on that. I would agree with Mrs. Bell. I'm concerned that we are um, going to be too inactive. I wanna make sure we represent the student voices we heard tonight and make sure that we have an action plan in order to assist them as soon as possible. So, so the motion itself was somewhat time limiting. It, it does state when the audit is completed, they sh you should be ready to roll with a plan and so on and so forth. But we don't know the duration of how long that will take. Right, the audits well, could be a year, it could be three, no, five months. No. We haven't picked We a... talked about that. That's why I asked I asked that question. So if you want to repeat. Yeah, so the I think the, the group we're going to bring forth with the recommendation says they'll have it done by December. Well, that's great if that's the one we pick as a board. There's no guarantee that's a what if. So I just want to have a plan in place because our students clearly need our support. I still think that's significant. 
Okay. I so would like to, we'll, I'd like to put it back on for discussion too. We can talk put it about on for discussion. Alternately provide yeah. in the interim. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any other new business items? We had discussed at one point uh, the possible formation of a advisory committee for learning and teaching. I, I don't know where to put that or it's something that, that I believe we. Well, we have a CAC, and I think, um, and it's the board CAC. So that would be something that, you know, if there's anything, any topics that LNT wants to run through or business services or policy, uh, by all means, um, talk to the co-chairs, get it on the agenda with them. Um, so I think that, that you can utilize that in any way. I don't think we need to have two CACs. We can have, uh, you know, we, we did talk about having the CAC sometimes doing multiple work. So, you know, a, a group might be working on an l and item that, that they, you would like run through there. Um, and another part of the group may be working on, a, you know, a facilities, a, a business service item. So um, absolutely, I think um, Mrs. McCabe and Mrs. Bell um, are open to what the board needs to use the CAC for. Perhaps what we can do is add for a, a for discussion section in the next open meeting about CAC and its role and yeah, how to use it. Yeah, and I was going to suggest Mr. McNally is co-chair to LNT. I mean, our next planning session, we can certainly talk about what our goals would be on what we want to achieve in LNT, and then we can bring that to the CAC too. It's that really my, my my main goal is just you know, greater transparency to the public for, for things so that we don't have you know same things that happen like like we had at the math curriculum where I think everybody felt blindsided, including the public. So sure, we can talk about that in the process. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So we've got several uh, new business items. Anything else? No, okay. So the next uh, item on the agenda was the facilities master plan presentation. Um, we have decided due to the late hour that that would be rescheduled um, and we would have that, that presented to us um, in the second uh, half of June, or I'm sorry, July. meeting president barker we would we're going to find a date um to schedule that a special, oh, special meeting, meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. okay we do have citizens comments i don't this has been up here miss mercian i don't know if anybody else who stayed wanted to um we have when we have two citizens but there are other more than two citizens out there and i didn't know if anybody else wanted to put their name down Okay, yes. Um, so we have, okay, Miss, uh, hang on. Uh, Ms. McKay, would you please read the end of the meeting policy? The school code provides for a public comment period at each board meeting subject to reasonable constraints. The practice of this board is to limit public comment to three minutes per speaker to a total of 15 minutes at the end of the meeting. Speakers addressing the board are expected to maintain a reasonable level of civility. Also, personnel matters are sensitive and confidential. Comments regarding individuals should be respectful. Insults and defamatory remarks have no place in this setting. The board will terminate public comment if speakers cannot adhere to these guidelines. Please identify yourself at the beginning of your remarks. Okay. Elisha, Elisha, Ignash, Ignash. Good night, please. I promise my six year old who matters. Um, I'm going to actually. Yeah. Illinois has moved into phase five, and any adult or child over the age of 12 that wants to be vaccinated has had the chance to do so. It is time to make masks optional in our schools. Our students seem to have, have been forgotten in the state's guidelines, and I know that District 303 can do better for them. I will repeat what has been stated by others that have stood here. A guideline is a suggestion, but not a law that we are required to follow. And that anyone concerned with exposure from a child has had the opportunity to get vaccinated for free. The World Health Organization states that children under the age of five should not wear a mask at all. And children aged six to 11 should only wear masks when a lengthy list of factors is considered first. At the top of that list is whether there is a widespread transmission in the area where the child resides. The answer is no. 
As of today, Illinois' infection rate is 0.66. So we do not have a widespread concern. On May 20th, the Illinois District 10 board met and approved an update to their school guidelines from mask mandate to mask recommendation for all students and staff in the district. Those children went to their last days of school with a choice. And I'm asking that our students be given the same opportunity that Illinois District 10 has given their students, mask optional. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we had a, another speaker, but I don't. Okay, so Ms. Raphael um, did uh, leave. Okay. There's no closed session this evening. May I have a motion to adjourn the regular board meeting on June 14th, 2021? So moved. At midnight. So moved. Second. Oh, Second. Okay. I believe we're gone. Meeting adjourned. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now I have any yellow? Okay. Oh, and it is now. It is now.